We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking up to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Let's talk some UFOs tonight as John Hudson is back. Yes, every couple of nights we bring in our intrepid UFO reporter, Stetson John Hudson, with the unbiased UFO report where he gets to the heart of what's happening in the UFO community and around the world for this fascinating subject. And, John, thank you so much for coming on in again, bud. It's always appreciated that you uh, tune us uh, and help us out and keep us up to date. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. It's been quite an interesting week, so we got some fun stuff to talk about. All right. There's a big story, a clarification in the power of UFO Twitter, which is an anomaly, a monster and a nightmare on its own sometimes. But uh, this leads to a couple of former guests here on Spaced Out Radio, and one of the gentlemen who experienced the USS Nimitz encounter, Gary Voorhees, and investigative journalist Ross Coulthard. What's going on here? So th- this was, to, I don't know, to me, and maybe I hope everyone else finds this as interesting as I did, you know, because to me, it was just, this was really cool on, on different levels because it started out, I was reading Ross's book, and... On chapter 11, he's going into details about the Nimitz case and he, you know, he pulls in some some other stuff that other people had. And it's, it's, a, it's a really good book. And at one point he mentions that it was it was from Gary Voorhees that he heard that there was a submerged object that was traveling 500 miles per hour underneath the water. And, you know, this caught my attention for two reasons. One, because I had originally heard it was fast, but I didn't hear it was that fast. And two, I had this vague memory that Gary Voorhees had actually recanted that story. And I knew Ross was a very careful reporter. So, you know, I started wondering, you know, did, did, it, did it go to print too fast? Did, did Ross not hear about this? Am I getting mixed up? Am I just not remembering this correctly? And in a lot of cases, what do you do when this happens? You're reading some author's book. You know, I mean, yeah, okay, maybe you can send him an email and he might respond, right? She, you know, she might answer you. But, you know, nowadays we have uh, things like UFO Twitter. So I got on Twitter and I basically posted the message to, to Gary. I copied Ross on it because, you know, I mean, obviously if he printed something incorrect, he's going to want to, you know, correct it. And I basically asked Gary, I said, hey, Gary, this, you know, this is in the book about, you know, it's, it's quoted by you. I thought you recanted this story because there was a problem with your source, you know, uh, am I getting mixed up or, or did something go wrong here? Right. And, uh, it was, you know, uh, Gary's, I said, been on the show. He's a great guy. Gary's one of the more down to earth, easy to talk to folks from that whole event. You know, we love Gary and, uh, and he, you know, he right, he comes right back and he says, you know, yes, it was secondhand information that was told to me at the time of the event. And it was essentially used at a context in an unidentified episode. Uh, but when I, the main problem was that when I tried to identify it, the person who told it to me went dark. So, you know, you first hear that and you're like, oh, okay, well, that's a bummer, right? But then he follows up and he says, I have, however, been able to verify that all the sonar techs that were involved, implying that it was a sonar tech that he was hearing this from, either directly or indirectly, that all the sonar techs are now f- and forever under NDA. And they indeed did they and they did indeed have a passive track, no wow. clue of speed. So so what this means is that that what he heard was likely accurate. He it, it's just that the person who told it to him either afterwards realized he shouldn't have or somehow got into a little bit of trouble for it. So now they're all locked down by NDAs. And so now one, you see why Ross went ahead and printed it because there is a still a, a strong possibility that it's true. 
my misconception is, is taken care of and Gary stepped in to bring the clarity to all of us and Ross gets to read it if he wants to. And so, and this all happened within, you know, uh, like an right. hour of me posting or something. So, well, I mean, the interesting, the interesting part for me on this is that there, all of these sonar techs are now locked down for the end of their lives. What the hell are they seeing that the United States Navy and the U S government feels that these people can no longer speak about I mean, yeah. that and is so, scary. So this so this is actually a, this was a side conversation that broke out as a result of this, because, um, you know, it, you know, a, a couple of people posted a question, said, you know, for life. And and I myself was curious because in my line of work, I've signed. I mean, honestly, I've probably signed 200 NDAs in my life, maybe more. Right. Pretty much every meeting I've ever had, I've had to sign an NDA for. But they're all like limited they're like two years three years maybe five years right and so but and i got this confirmed by several people including our own um science bob that essentially um military ndas have two criteria you're either locked down until the the information that you were you're aware of is is declassified by some other party within the government or until you die, in which case you're welcome to report it through a medium or you know whatever belief system you have. And so they don't do time-based NDAs. All their NDAs are based on either declassification or end of life. And so this is just their standard NDA. So it, what that means is it doesn't really matter as long as it's serious enough to lock it down um, until it's declassified, it's serious enough to lock it in for, for, their, for their perceivable life. But yes, it does speak volumes. That is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And once again, it leads to the fact, before we move on to the next story, that it just throws another wrench in this entire phenomena on what they are seeing and what they don't want to go out to the public. It's one thing to get F-18s to film little Tic Tacs, but any type of uh, scenario from the movie of The Abyss going through the oceans we're not allowed to see that. Yeah, nothing and, and to I, see I, here, people. Nothing exactly, to see here. Exactly. But but I'd also like to just point out that you know, as as all of you are are, are reading books, you're watching you know uh, YouTube presentations, you're listening to podcasts. If you hear something and the data doesn't match, don't just give up. Don't get frustrated. Get on to Twitter, post the question. You'll be amazed how fast the people on Twitter will help you get down to that answer. In a lot of cases, it's the principles that respond. That's amazing. Let's move on to topic number two tonight, because after being silent for almost a year, year and a half, Tom DeLong of Angels and Airwaves, formerly a Blink-182, and of course of uh, the head of the To The Stars Academy of Arts and Science, finally broke his silence on doing a podcast uh, with... I'm going to call it another fanboy. And that's not an insult yeah. to the host of the show or anything like that. But once again, Tom comes out and wants to talk and play UFOs again. And, and by my wording, I'm sure you could tell that I'm not a big fan. Love his music. Think he's very talented, you know, and, and everything. I got to download it. But in the end, not a good ufologist. Not a good ufologist. So what's going on here with Mr. DeLong? So, you know, so, I mean, I, I will, I will differ with you a little bit there in that, the, you know, I don't, I don't really, you know, to me, Tom is um, in many ways, no different than all, than so many of the other podcasters that are, that are, are that everyone's listening to right now. Right. The, everyone comes into this with some kind of an experience and some kind of passion for it. And a lot of people don't have, you know, science or journalism background. So in many ways, you know, he is representative of a large portion of, of, the, of this community, good or bad. And but what this really was, and it's funny because I listened to it again right before I came on because I, I wanted to kind of, you know, really kind of dive into some of it. And this really was a, a debutante ball. The, this really was a coming out party. This really was a reintroduction of To the Stars and a reintroduction of Tom DeLong and a reintroduction. Well, you don't really need to reintroduce Jim Simivan, but, um, you know, and the thing that was unfortunate was that, you know, um, you know, Doctor um, uh, Doctor Brian, uh, uh, what is it, Doctor Brian Keating? I mean, this guy. I mean, he's a sharp cat, right? I mean, he's the he's a chancellor's professor of physics for UC San Diego, right? 
So he's, you know, like the top, you know, one of the top physics guys at UC San Diego. He also recently became a member of the Galileo Project, right? He's a very articulate, very bright individual. And it was really him hosting it. And uh, and so I was hoping for some pretty direct questions. He was the one that clearly, you know, had a lot of admiration for the both of them and uh, and, and played it pretty clean. And then um, we had the return of, of uh, Kermit Jamondal. Uh, and once again, Kurt, I'm, I'm, I'm annihilating your last name. I apologize. Um, for the host of The Theory of Everything. And, um, you know, Kurt was was able to, you know, ask some more direct questions. But unfortunately, he was just coming off the Travis Wilton inter interview where, you know, his direct questioning, um, you know, kind of put Travis in a defensive state. So Kurt was playing it a little safer this time because I think he was, you know, didn't want to do the same thing again. And uh, and so he asked some pretty, you know, um, you know, uh, open open-ended questions like his first question was just what the hell's going on with skinwalker like i don't get it like how does skinwalker relate to any of this um and it was kind of interesting because you know listening to it a second time um there was some interesting information that came out of it but ultimately if you look at the description of the podcast in the description of the podcast they include a detailed description of both vault and scout which are their two there are two projects, um, Scout being the reporting tool and Vault being the proprietary note, proprietary, um, what they call AI um, um, uh, collaboration tool that basically mines several global databases. Uh, keep in mind when you see AI in these contexts, read ML. It's machine learning. It's not AI. And so, and then it describes the, the entertainment division. So the the description of the podcast really comes off as a new prospectus, as a, as a new um, you know, a uh, summary of what the, of what to the stars is. And then, and, and Tom, Tom was a reformed Tom. He was, a, he was a quieter Tom. He was a nicer Tom. He was a, he was an oh so friendly Tom uh, to the point where, you know, he said things like, which I never thought I'd hear come out of his mouth was, uh, you know, I have no science to back that up. And he said, um, yes, I've heard that, but it's not my place to, to, to go into detail. So Tom has, Tom's been trained better. Tom is being, and I'm not saying he's being, you know, uh, overly so. He's basically behaving the way he should have been behaving in the first place. If this is a Tom we've been seeing this whole time, a lot of things would have gone different for Tom and quite possibly for To The Stars. Um, See, I'm going to cut you off, I'm gonna cut yeah, you please, off please, right please, there. Please, please, and I'll, please. And I'll tell you, because just a couple of days ago, all right, Tom put a, a big bunch of clippings about UFOs together to post on Instagram and Twitter. And okay. one of the scenes that he put in there was on Joe Rogan, where he said, do you want me to whip out my bleep? Oh, right, right, right. You know, yep. and then he then he comes into this in, interview sounding all humble and wholesome and, and, and professional. I, I don't get it from him. I don't understand the purpose. And well, we'll, we'll see if it sticks. I, I totally get that. I totally get that. You know, I, and trust me, I wanted Tom DeLong to succeed. I did. I've always been, a, you know, and maybe it's because I'm a fan of the band, and, you know, totally. and, and, you know, whether or not people like the, his music with Blink-182 or not, you know, that's everyone else's opinion. I mean, the only way that people are going to be wrong in music is if they insult Guns N' Roses. You know, that's the only way that anybody will be wrong in music. But the point that I'm getting at is this. You know, since the beginning, that uh, to to give people a reminders, the TSA TTSA, in my opinion, has been a cluster of fumbles and bumbles while putting out some great information at the same time. And the but unfortunate you had to dig for it, you didn't. It, I don't think you did have to dig for it. Well, I think you had it to was, dig for the good stuff. You had a lot of you had a lot of other stuff that, that got in the way. What really set my red flags off, and you can go back and listen to this show going back four years ago now, hard to believe almost, all right, when they held a pressless press conference to announce the To The Stars Academy, it was in Seattle. Guess what? Dave's in British Columbia. Old Davey would have driven down to Seattle to catch that press conference. Every journalist, UFO journalist, uh, if there there is no such thing in that term, and I, you just use a term at least MTV hate. would have showed up. I mean, come on. I mean, some you know, reporters would have come if they had invited press to the press conference. Right. No, I I get you. I get you. Uh, I just have a distrust with Mister Delong, and and you know what? Um, 
I'm going to put a quick challenge out to you here because we do got to get going here in, in about a minute here, but I want you to stick around. Okay. If, if, if you're still awake, yeah, please. I know no, you're yeah, a night owl. Yep. And, no, and no, what, no, we'll yep. do, what we'll do is when we end the radio show, let's do a little bit of an after show on this topic. Sure, sure. Uh, right afterwards on our YouTube yeah, yeah. channel yep, while yep, I'm editing yep, yep. the show. So yep, totally, let, totally. Let, let's let's do that and let's let's fire this up because yeah, I, I'm telling you, I'm fired up tonight. I'm, well, I'm, no, I'm, totally. And, and we should do it. But you know what? If we're going to do that, let me cover Let me just say one thing really quick. People sure. should listen to it because – as Tom always does, he uses language that that conveys things that he might not have intended to be sharing. So he uses language like um, cuts between cells with no vascular collapse when talking about um, uh, cattle mutilations. He talks about materials that materialize, that displace time the way a submarine displaces water. He comes up with some interesting descriptions of things, um, including a, a cow that he claims had its heart removed without any incisions to the body. And so it, in Tom's normal style, as he's talking, he uses the language that he heard it with. And because it's not his native language, it conveys more than he perhaps intends about the where this information is coming from. So it, it's worth listening to. Yeah. And, and you know what, let's get into it a little bit. And you know what? Hey, I'm pretty sure that uh, Joe Mergia is going to go nuts on me after this, you know, you know, because he always does. And, you know, I'll just have to tell him that, uh, you know, his Brillo pad hairdo, if he doesn't watch it, I'll stick him against the wall because it's like Velcro, you know, so we'll, we'll get into it. I love Joe. I do. Oh, I just absolutely. love it. I just absolutely. love insulting him every, cause he does it to me. So I'm going to do it back to him. He's and finally, guy. I'm going to fire that first shot. Fire that first salvo over his, over his Brillo pad. All right, let's get to the news right now. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire. At the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the proper, the smart, the intelligent. Yes, it's left-handed people day. And old Davies give it a fist pump because on International Left-Handers Day, here is what we do know about left-handed people, a.k.a. people like me. That we make up 10% of the world's population and scientists believing uh, being that left-handed is influenced by genetics, environment, and random chance. With a long list of famous left-handed people like Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Dave Scott, Benjamin Franklin, and Ronald Reagan. See, I just threw my name in there. You know, I mean, it's one of those cool things that we got to talk about. And, uh, you know, researchers at the University of Athens found a negligible difference between the intelligence of left-handed and right-handed people in a 2017 study and meta-analysis for their findings, researchers analyzed 36 studies that measured the IQ scores of more than 66,108 individuals. The meta-analyses found that right-handed people had slightly higher IQs, but when the largest study was excluded, the researchers found no difference between the two groups. We're just as smart as them righties, even though it's a right-handed world. Meanwhile, as far as creativity goes, they found that left-handed people think they are more creative, but they didn't spend significantly more time on artistic pursuits than right-handed people. That survey, quick uh, question, more than 20,000 uh, participants. That was done by, uh, let me see here, the Fast Company, who did that survey. So is there a difference between righties and lefties? The answer is yes, because there's so few of us lefties. But in a right-handed world, us lefties, we got it right. We did. Pink dolphins, piranhas, and black caiman. It sounds like the stuff of legend or Dave's nightmare, except the pink dolphins. But in fact, it's the inhabitants of a protected wetland system in the Amazon, home to thousands of rare animal species, fascinating tales of tribal gods turning men into dolphins. Storytelling is part of the culture of the indigenous groups who live along the Amazon rainforest, and the wetlands play an important part in the yarns that have been spun for centuries. But the waters of the Lagos de Terrapato 
aren't just home to tall tales. They are such an inhabitant, including, uh, or pardon me, they are important habits, habitat for animal species that were granted protective status in 2018, following a five-year battle to petition for the wetlands region to be internationally recognized. Scientists have been conducting research into the wetlands, which included Lake Terrapato and other areas as well. So these creatures, they're going to be safe. You know, just be careful because piranha like to eat things, especially if it goes splash. And caimans, well, they like to eat people too. Let's just be honest. There's going to be a lot of eating going on. Don't go for a swim. Not going to be good. <laughs> Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then we read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. What creepy pasta stories really freak you out? Danny, none of them. I actually find them quite relaxing, probably because of the narrator, Swamp Dweller. Magnus, the stairs of the forest ones are weird, and the SNR ones. Ted, Russian sleep experiment. Tim, well, Mystic 411 is covered, so for sheer terror, Dogman, both good reasons not to go in the woods. Terror Bigfoot doesn't worry me so much anymore. Dogman, it is. Peter, creepy pasta moon landing story, totally freaky. I think about that story all the time. Thank you to everybody listening to the news. Thank you to John Hudson for the UFO report and Rob Antia from Swamp Dweller. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, whatever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitch and Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, say it with me, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Big question coming out of the Spreaker chat from Bill WD40. Is Chad Smith left-handed? We're going to have to find that out. That could be breaking news, Bill WD40. Could be breaking news. HL Westlake, how are you? Good to see you. All right, let's bring John back up here. How you doing, Johan? Good, good, good. You know, one interesting side note about uh, left-handed people is uh, when you come to the whole concept of left brain uh, and the, the way the different uh, right and left brain handles different operations, it's not reversed for left-handed people, uh, which I think is interesting. I always assumed that left-handed people had their brains reversed as well, but it's not true. Left-handed people typically have their hemispheres in the same orientation as right-handed people. Hold on. I got to grab a picture of this, and I'm going to send it because I think uh, I don't think Chad Smith is in the uh, chat room right now. This is fucking awesome. Oh, pardon my language. I didn't mean to swear. I'm trying to get out of that habit, swearing on here. I, I could do it during the show, but the minute the show is on, I want to go straight potty mouth. <laughs> and uh, it's terrible. Uh, so this is just amazing. Uh, Swamp Dweller there is like, 
Hey, I'm Chad Smith. All right. That is awesome. I'm sending that to him right now. That That's going to crack him up. So I don't think he's here right now. Ozzy Steve, thank you for another super chat. Oh, and then he's called himself Chad Dweller. That is amazing. Chad Dweller. That is That's just awesome. amazing. That is awesome. All right. You got me fired up here, dude. Gorgeous Jean <laughs> Beckett. What is happening? She's looking lovely tonight. So I've heard. But um, all right, where do you want to start here? Well, the one thing I I want to I want to I want to pose a, a question is because sure. I've been trying to figure out for a long time why, with as much as as Tom uh, didn't necessarily perform how most of us thought he would uh, overall, why some of us reacted one way and some of us reacted the other. And I was trying to think of like, you know, what is it that really bugs some of us about him? And I, I, I think, and, and, and I want your opinion. I think part of the problem is, is that when he posts these pictures, when he posts these things on Instagram, what he shows is a complete lack of discernment. He shows, he shows a, a, a lack of ability to, to ferret out uh, what is worth posting, what isn't. And so that puts all of us, caused all of us to put his judgment in question. And considering how much information he was presenting otherwise that we wanted to, to trust, it then caused us to have doubts on everything else because if his judgment was so bad posting this stuff, what else is his judgment bad about? And I, and I think that 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 whittles down what some of us were found so frustrating about about what he was posting. I think for me, <clears throat> like if I go back in history here, okay, if we go way back, I remember ta- telling our audience point blank, you know what, let's see how this plays out. You know, let, let's sit back and, and see what happens here. Because as a as a journalist, and I took a lot of heat over this. I don't know if you were if you were kind of part of the club at that point, but on, on UFO Twitter, I was getting roasted left right and center uh for well that was still the everything. pink cloud phase that was yeah. still the pink cloud phase where, where everyone was giving tom a, a lot of runway yeah hi carbines right how are you and uh well we don't want that kind of channel on our <laughs> no we don't want that kind of channel here we'll just get rid of that one but um no man i the red first red flag for me was the pressless press conference. That was so weird. And then that was so weird. And then the next red flag for me was like every other media outlet, I tried to get them on the air. Couldn't get them on the air. Uh, I had uh, request after request. Uh, denied we're not doing interviews then you'd hear them on coast to coast or 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 with jimmy and you know it'd be like what the heck is going on here you know you go i go and try nope not even a response i put out 15 requests and and i um well, and you know what's crazy is that is that you weren't the only yeah. one. And I mean, I mean, no. and, and this is this is this my this is my personal <clears throat> opinion, but I firmly believe that in the case of some of the radio hosts that really turned negative on Tom, a lot of it actually came down to this. It came down to the way interviews were handled, the way people people that even knew Tom that were, you know had his phone number were, were would communicate with him second second channel right and still when they would ask for an interview they'd get shut down and i know that i know that his sister was was uh for some of it was a gatekeeper and was it was a very strict gatekeeper um so i have no idea how much you know input um the rest of the crew had into it but i think i think a lot of the animosity that grew but from from all the different show hosts came down to exactly what you're talking about with just the way, and it wasn't even like there wasn't even a polite like like if they'd come back and said, "Well, look, um, we're we're trying to pace the guys because we don't want them to get burned out. We have a list of target, which we're trying to do for some 
month. After that, we're going to open it up to everyone and I'll make sure you're top in the list. They could have done a lot of things to mitigate the, the, well, the and, and damage. I'll give you an they didn't do any of it. And I agree with you. I'll give you an example. Okay. And this is no offense to the names that I'm going to be dropping here. All right. Because I've talked to these guys about it and I'm well over it. But my concern going back four years ago is somebody like us or Richard Dolan or Grant Cameron or, or others with podcasts or, or radio shows, even George Norrie for that matter, couldn't get an interview with these guys outside of George Knapp, outside of Jimmy Church at the time, and, well, and outside even of Jimmy Al was even Jimmy and, was having but, trouble. But at the beginning, they Tom yep, and correct. Jimmy were talking quite often. Yep. Yep. And and who was the other one? Alejandro Rojas was the other one. So what had happened oh, was man. they started doing interviews and then all of a sudden they started meeting up with all of these people who we've never heard of before at that time, like Danny Silva and others. And God bless Danny for the work. Danny's a good guy and he is a hard worker. Uh, yep. I, I will never, ever crap on Danny's parade for his hard work. I may not agree with, with some of his stuff. And he, I know he doesn't agree with a lot of mine, but I really enjoyed Danny's, uh, uh, his tenacity to try and bring these stories out. And, and he, and he made an, a lot of trust in, in what's going on. But I mean, they were not talking to anybody. They were not talking to anyone outside of their controlled environment. So that led to my second issue, my second red flag of everything, which was when you control the media, you control the story. And, and, and going back to the 60s, Marshall McLuhan, he famously said, the medium is the message. And if UFOs is the medium and the, mes the message, and you're controlling the medium of where your people are talking, then that's where you control what goes out. You control well, and everything. Here's the thing. I, I've been I've been part of, of product launches for companies where we've been bringing out a whole new line of product where, where we have like a billion dollars bet on something, right? And and in the beginning, we we do we control the message because we know at that point we have some deficiencies in our product. It's not fully baked yet. So we have to we have to really curtail where we talk to, who we talk to, how we show it to them, and so forth. But the whole idea is, is that you get to a certain point where you take all the cuffs off, you open it up, and you let people really go after it. Otherwise, what have you done? I mean, like the whole reason why you control the message that much is because you're afraid of what's gonna happen if you don't, right? And that yeah. that in itself is a statement. Yeah, but you know what? Like in talking to Lou Elizondo about that on this show, that was one of the issues he had is he was he had no idea that there were all these shows, whether it was John Greenwald, ourselves, or or even Richard Dolan or, or anybody else who wanted to talk to him about this. He yep. wanted, in, and this is his words to us, he wanted to, when he came out, he wanted to, the TTSA to be the bastion of information that almost like MUFON had dropped the ball over the years, okay? And and he wanted to be that, that the TTSA to be that public voice. Because here they were announcing back on October 11th, 2017, that we're going to be open. We're going to be transparent. We're going to find out what's going on. And then, you know, Joe Rogan comes along. Let's put nuclear weapons up in space, according to Tom. We need to get nukes up there interview. because these these are evil bastards that are going to, you know, come and harm us. Just, you know, a little bit too much, uh, too much influence from people like Peter Lavenda. Nothing, not that mm -hmm. there's anything wrong with Peter Lavenda. Okay. And that's kind of where that message started. And then the famous quote, would you like me to whip my dick out? right on Joe Rogan and i know for a fact in talking to some insiders that it was after that interview you watched tom went silent 
Oh yeah. Because, oh yeah. Because, no. Because it, it, after we that all knew. Comment, after, from what I heard from the inside people, okay, is after that comment was made, they were there was three people in their next board meeting, three or four people ready to resign, and they had to remind him this isn't rock star time anymore. This isn't rock. You want to play with the big boys? We've allowed you into the group. That you have to show up and be part of the big boys. No, and, right? and I'll tell you, like when, when I watched that interview, when that interview ended, my first thought was, wow, well, huh? I hope I see Tom again someday, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, because I mean, I've seen people do that for companies and, and they just disappear. You never see them again. <laughs> oh, I hear you. I hear you, man. You're not allowed to, put the, you are never allowed to talk to the press again. We're very sorry. We picked the wrong person. Here's a, here's an office for you. Go sit and, and do paperwork. <laughs> It was, it was, you know, it was my, and the thing, the thing is, is that, you know, in Tom's defense, that's the sort of line where if he was getting interviewed by the Rolling Stone or, 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 you know, by Rolling Stone or, or by MTV or something like that. And it was about one of his new albums, right. The crowd would love it. Like, I mean, he would get, you know, they, they would think it was really funny. Right. Um, And so, you know, that's the behavior that he, that he, you know, was accustomed to, you know, and, um, Hey, you know, one thing I want to give a shout out to a couple people. Bim Jim, yeah, yeah. thanks for joining us. Uh, Swamp Dweller still here, hanging on out. Uh, Red Panda Koala, welcome to our channel. And uh, who else came in? I there was one over on Twitch. Lil Cam, how are you? Welcome. And did you ever read my re the article that I wrote about the fourteen reasons why? I never trusted the TTSA. You know, actually, um, funny enough, Dave, um, I I remember that, and um, I I I I read a little bit of it, and um, and I decided that at the time uh, I didn't want to finish it because um, because I liked you, and I was worried that after I read that I, I might not like you anymore, <laughs> so I didn't finish reading it. <laughs> well, I'm pulling it up right now, so. <laughs> Number one, in no particular order, number one was the pressless press conference. That was amazing. That yeah. was amazing. That was number one. I'll, actually, you know what? I'll bring it over here right now so that way people can see. Hold on. I'll share it. So I'll read this uh, for everyone here. And for, and uh, believe it or not, Jim Semivan, actually, according to Melinda Leslie, uh, said this article that I wrote, and everybody has to realize this article that I wrote back in January this of this early. year. Um, this really, uh, Jim Semivan, if we could go by that word with Melinda Leslie, uh, said that I was about 95% correct mm -hmm. on this. Yep. So uh, I don't, yep, I agree. Uh, so the first one we already talked about, pressless press conference. Uh, the next one, denial of media requests. And I said from its inception, the TTSA, rightfully or wrongfully, uh, were very elusive on the media front. If you weren't George Knapp or at the beginning, Jimmy Church from Coast to Coast AM, if you weren't a mainstream media outlet, the likelihood of getting an interview request granted by TTSA was slim to none. Personally, I put in 15 requests for interviews. The only time I got close was when I was asked to provide questions at the forefront, which I just I declined to do. As a journalist, I am a I am professional, and I will not supply questions up front to any guest. It's part of the business. However, the TTSA didn't decline me; just declined me and Spaced Out Radio. They declined pretty much everyone with a podcast or radio show that was of the alternative media. Over time. They eventually sporad started sporadically granting media requests. But it, if you look at the majority of the programs people from the TTSA were being interviewed by, they were shows that held bias towards supporting their efforts and weren't mm -hmm. asked, basically softball questions is what they and, were And let me at. add something real yeah. quick. I, 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 it'll take some, uh, some time to get enough data to do a proper analysis, but I, it's my personal belief that in the end, what they will discover is, is that that's what hurt the stock. 
because essentially what they were, that what they, because a lot of people don't realize that that, that the stock offering failing was the first severe nail in the coffin for the original vision of TTSA. Okay. Because they were expecting to raise like $50 million and they raised like $2 million. But and it, but it the was, problem was, but no, it was, it, real quick, were, it, it, yeah, so ahead. many people were, were pissed at them for, for the media interactions. And there was so many, so much negative talk about it that the very community that they were hoping to, would buy the stock got turned off and got concerned about the company. So I think in many ways, their refusal to allow interviews actually was one of the reasons why the stock didn't sell. Well, I mean, I think it's more than that, though. I mean, when they came out in that first press conference and were discussing the fact that they wanted to be the, the the face of the UFO community. They wanted to bring disclosure. They wanted to bring everything. You know what? Kratas don't bring disclosure. You know what I'm saying? No, but originally they were, they were inferring they were going to build a, a ship. They showed us a ship. And they showed us ship. a ship. Absolutely. That's what I mean. That's I mean, I don't think I remember, but there was a whole point where, where people started asking like, Wait, wait, wait. Does this mean they're not building the ship? I mean, a lot of people, it was all about the ship, <laughs> you know, oh, and, and the, the ship totally went, 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 went bye bye as soon as that stock offering failed. And then as a, as a second, as a second attempt, they tried to get the money through the government, which is where the crater came in. Right. But even yeah. that failed. And so at that point, like, I mean, you know, as you know, I've said to you before, basically, as soon as the stock offering failed, I was expecting justice to walk away. Because, I mean, he had nearly an unlimited budget at Skunk Works, right? And so you're, and he, he builds things. That's what he does. Justice yeah. builds cool stuff. And so he was done. And, they, and he stuck around a lot longer than I thought he would. Well, I think he stuck around because Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo were there. And there's yeah, a tight bond there. Yeah, I You agree. know, the other thing, yeah, you agree. know, they weren't answering any questions, okay? We all know now that Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo got the videos out. How they got the videos out, the three, you know, the gimbal, Go Fast, and Tic Tac, <coughs> were when Elizondo ran a tip, he, 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 there would be a sheet or a form online that he would have to fill out, and they would have to put on there uh, terrestrial, UAP, or other, and they would have to check one of those off. If yep. it fell under UAP, it was it would become top secret. He checked uh, on on the advisement of Chris Mellon. He checked the terrestrial box or whatever. Yeah, that no, box I have a, I have a copy of it. They 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 gamed the system is what they did. They basically yes. they found a loophole and they took advantage of it. So they didn't really after the there was an investigation after the investigation was done it was found that they were not at fault it was the office that processed it with, that was at fault but basically they used their insider knowledge to essentially game the form yeah to our to our benefit but I don't think they were were all excited about sharing that information no but I mean <laughs> here's the thing you know and Elizondo said this too one of the back downfalls of TTSA was the fact that they really turned their back on the UFO community. Yes. They yes. underestimated the brilliancy and the minds and the and the love and the excitement of the UFO community, and they were the anti UFO UFO group. Yep. That, and I think I think one I think one mistake they one huge mistake they made is I think that they honestly believed that by showing by opening the Komodo to the New York Times by essentially showing as much as they did privately to the New York Times and, and using that to convince the New York Times that then when the New York Times came out and said what they did, I really think that what they expected to happen was for everyone to be so bloody excited about the, the crumbs they were getting that they didn't ask for any more. They didn't poke at it. They didn't question well, it. They didn't, they didn't, and that was insane. I don't know why they believe that, but yeah, I but think that's what they believe. Shame on... Shame on the New York Times, though, John, the editors of the New York Times, where that UFO article was the was the hottest selling New York Times newspaper since 9-11. They made millions off that. But you know what they didn't do? 
normally when you have a red hot story that is going viral like what that, what could you possibly do as a follow up? You don't. You do you a follow up, <laughs> and they didn't. They didn't do. You a do follow multiple up. follow ups. You take six different angles at it. You you leak them out over months. I mean, you, you can turn it into a no, whole year but, long project. But the fact the fact is, when that story nothing. broke, usually within the next week, there is a follow up story with further information. Now, from what I heard. And I, I and I'm hearing this secondhand that Kane, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal had a follow up article ready to go, and the editors of the New York Times nixed it. They nixed it. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know. I really don't know. Well, look, you know what? The reason why I think you can you can somewhat safely think it's true is because. Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal are 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 good journalists, and and they they uh, I'm not saying that they're completely unbiased. Um, you know, I I I I know you know something about Leslie Keen's you know perspective on things, and so I'm not going to argue that that doesn't ever come into to the way to what they report and how they report it. But they are professionals, and I think that if 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 you if your understanding is that that's how they you play ball, then I guarantee you they had something ready, and 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 I think that you know they presented it and. You know, whatever, how the New York Times responded to them doing it, whether there was any debate, whether there was any consideration of doing it. But I think it's safe to assume they would have produced something because that's that's what a professional would do. OK, I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a sports analogy here because it's the easiest way for me to get that across. OK, if I if I use a sports, a sports journalism thing, Tom Brady going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers after 20 years in New England. All right. That would be like breaking the story that Tom Brady has signed a deal, a two or three year deal with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he gets to Tampa and there's no press conference. And all we have is this story of Tom Brady is going to be playing football for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this coming NFL season. Yep. And, and what, nobody, what, nobody's interviewing, nobody's interviewing uh, Brady. Nobody's interviewing the management of or the coaching staff of Tampa Bay. That's what happened here with the New York Times. And, is, and let me ask you something: if if you if the analogy you just gave actually happened what would people start mumbling about? They would start questioning whether it's really happening or not. Exactly. They would, they would start questioning whether what, whether what they heard was true. Uh, they would start questioning whether there wasn't some dark secret behind what was going on because they would expect that kind of follow-up, right? And and that's I think that's part of what happened. Is I mean, it, it was a vacant valley of silence uh, even if it wasn't the New York Times that followed up, why why wasn't like you know sixteen other uh, other newspapers writing follow ups? I mean, I it was weird the, just the silence that we got after that. It was totally strange. It made well, me suspicious. I mean, it, it was strange, and that's and that's the big thing right there, dude. That's the big thing. Okay. Um, and, and that's what I don't get. And and GF 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 G. I now know who you are, so thank you. Um, I, I'll get to that point in a minute on Twitter if you don't mind. Uh, but thank you for that. Here, let let's go through the list because the question yeah. that Meaty Toes has is, is pretty is pretty relevant. Okay. Um, but let's let's go through the remainder of the list here. Yeah, yeah. For, for a second. All right. And when did you when did you write this again? I wrote this uh, a couple days after. Uh, this was December twenty second. I wrote this, so this was two days after uh, Elizondo announced he was leaving the TTSA. Okay. Okay. All okay. Right, okay. So nobody ever questioned the TTSA being able to put their logo on the United States Navy videos. Yeah, I remember you being you being really pushed out of shape about that. I thought that was really interesting. 
it, it, it but, um, but the media, it didn't, the media didn't follow it up. <clears throat> How, you know, that, that would be like me putting my spaced out radio logo on those videos claiming property. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. In, in reality, in reality, these were stolen videos. Now, there's a lot of people who are going to say, really, Dave, stolen? Hey, they were United States Navy videos that were accidentally leaked. And I do know for a fact that Elizondo and Mellon nearly lost their top secret clearance because of it. There was a very formal investigation mm -hmm. as to how those how those got released. There was, All right. was a very and, formal investigation. And that's why after the U.S. Navy, a year later admitted that those videos were theirs and real that all of a sudden the media outlets stopped putting the TTSA logo on United States Navy uh um Material. ownership of the videos uh yep. the other issue no well, talking and real, a, a quick funny side note is yeah. is it is it the, the 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 part i found amusing about all of it is, is that what I found almost more strange about TTSA putting their logo on it was the fact that everyone else didn't clue in on the fact that that meant everyone else could do so too. And what I was expecting was I was starting to see that I was expecting to start to see that video popping up all over the place with everyone's personal logo on it because because basically what they were saying is it, it was it was it was public domain material and anyone can just put their label on it. I mean, because they didn't have any actual, authority over that over that content there there was no there was no official they they, were, they weren't even involved in the chain of command i mean a, cha a chain of a custody they, they were just advertise it was like they were it was like they were embedding advertising into the video yeah so um the other one no talk not allowed to talk aliens well guess what people i don't care if they're not from here okay something is flying them whether it's inside or by remote control, something is flying them. And well, this and has the, been the biggest joke, Dave. I mean, this has been the biggest joke because you talk to anybody. You, I mean, I have several friends and family members that you know were not into this topic um, before and have recently, you know, suddenly taken a lot of interest. Or I didn't know they had interest before, and they take a lot of interest. And you start talking to them, and they sit there and they they kind of get quiet and they and they talk, and they go, but wait a second. Who's flying these things? Exactly. And you, go, you go, sorry, can't talk about that right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? How ridiculous is that? I mean, it's like well, it's and really juvenile. But that also leads to that also leads to number five, uh, where DeLong was very, very outspoken about his dislike for at that time President Donald Trump and his support for Joe Biden. Now, leading up to the election, uh, DeLong was very, very disparaging about President Trump. Now, whether you love or hate Trump is irrelevant <clears throat> in this conversation. But when you are dealing with high, top-secret people like Elizondo and Mellon, who have worked for both Republicans and for Democrats, the last thing you need is your TTSA CEO talking about Biden and ripping into a president when you're trying to get information out of both sides. And if you look at it, it was a Republican and a Democrat in Warner and Rubio who worked together to get this thing into the mm -hmm. Intelligence Committee meetings. Thank you. To Chris Mellon, which is one of the beautiful things about this topic, is it is actually cross, you know, cross the aisle stuff. This is actually this is actually real bipartisan material. It's a real mm -hmm. it's a real opportunity to to work with both sides. The last time you want to be calling out the other side, regardless of how you feel. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and this was just an observation that I put in there at the beginning, was that there was absolutely. Uh, there was absolutely nobody from ufology in there, in the original group. It was all spooks. Where was Stanton Friedman? He was still alive back then. Where was Peter Davenport? Where was uh, 
even somebody along the lines of Richard Dolan in there or, or Jim, not so much Jim Mars at the time, you know, and you but, know what's most funny about that is that is that my understanding is is that um, Grant Cameron was approached. Now, to what degree, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I never got any indication that he was offered any kind of an official role within TTSA. But they did. He, he did speak about the fact that that they came to him and offered him s- somewhat of an insider's um, connection to TTSA, and he said no. He, he said, no, I don't want that. I want to report on you from the outside. And he turned them down. And so well, I, I don't know. I don't know how many other people they did that with. But I but my understanding, at least according to Grant, is that they did. They did that with him. They um, may have. And, and I think he have. made the right decision. You know, then you get DeLong in number seven, where he would put all these weird posts up. What if I were to tell you? What if I were to let you know? And then... Within a couple of hours, that post would be deleted. And thank God for UFO Twitter on for you know screenshotting screenshot <laughs> all, all of them. And Tom though was getting in big time shit because a lot of the stuff he was putting out there was either a top secret or b was so far off the off the actual event or what was happening that he was using his own imagination to do these what if I were to tell you and he was getting in crap from the rest of the board and of course we talked no, I mean, about every every time one of those tweets went out man i i guarantee you uh, uh elizondo melon they all their the all their stomach sank oh boy what yeah. did tom what did tom post this time absolutely right? and, and the thing that was funny was that you know for for me like i mean i i guess i guess part of it is that you know I, I even though Tom was like the 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 head of the company, I I've done several startups before, and so I I know like how founders behave and what founders will do, and how once a company gets started, you 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 take the founders and you you put them somewhere else because they're they're usually not someone you want to put in front of the press once things get going, and so I so for me I could I could kind of you know cage tom in a way that i didn't have to take him all that seriously and so for me a lot of his postings where he would post it and then he would delete it made me laugh because it was so funny that he thought that that made it okay that like (laughs) you know that it was okay for him to like if you if you feel that you have to delete that post after three hours here's a clue you probably right. shouldn't have posted it in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, it was, it was, it was hilarious. I mean, it, it was, was, um, it was, it was actually, it was really, if it, as long as it didn't irritate you, it was really funny. It was, um, it was, and it didn't, it, and I think what, I think what happened was that he couldn't say what he wanted to say. So he, he thought that this was a way he could say what he wanted to say without getting in yeah. trouble for it. Well, and, and it didn't work. The other part coming out was that, Tom had made a comment in the later stages of TTSA that they were not a UFO group. It went contrary to everything that they had stood for in that first press conference. And I think that little comment really hurt a lot of their supporters. It really did. And that's where Elizondo actually came out and said, you know, we alienated the UFO community. Well, you That's know, why talk- Elizondo has been killing himself going on every little tiny podcast he can find because he's, he's trying to make amends. Yes. That's what he's doing. I agree with you. He's, 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 he's making amends. Right. And now the one thing I will say is that, you know, part of what we've seen as Elizondo has done this kind of world tour is we have seen one of the things occur that I think TTSA was trying to avoid by controlling their 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 assets so heavily and that is that he's he's shared a lot of main like really important information on really really small little channels yes. where not many people have seen it and yeah. while if you're if you're following him and you watch everything he puts out you still get it and it's interesting and it's it's super cool for that little podcast to get that information if you're actually trying to get all that information out that's not how you want to do it right that that's that's not the good that's that's not how you get the information out. And so 
part of what they were trying to keep from happening it did actually end up happening, which is kind of funny because yeah. it, it did well, kind of play out the way they were afraid it would. Another blow came out shortly after TTSA was announced that DeLong had approached Renario Hernandez, the head of Dr. Edgar Mitchell's Free Experiencers project, where they, uh, for people unfamiliar with Free, oh, uh, right. this was a group God, that... Uh, that Dr. Edgar Mitchell put together to try and gain some sort of statistics on people who had extraterrestrial contact, abductions, and and anything to do with, with alien contact. And the statistics literally showed that I think it was like 80 or 84% of people who had ET contact would want it to happen again and had a positive experience. Mm -hmm. Well, you, then you go back to the Rogan interview where Tom was saying, we got to put nukes in space. We got to get ready to fight these aliens that are coming down like the movie Independence Day to blow us into smithereens, to eat us, to use us as food and slaves and everything along those lines. And we got to get them nukes up there. We got to get them nukes up there. They're afraid of our nukes. We know they're afraid of our nukes. And in the end, we find out thank you to Ray Renario Hernandez, that he was approached by DeLong privately and DeLong asked to buy those statistics mm -hmm. off of them. Mm -hmm. You know what would have happened if they bought, if they sold them? Those statistics would have went right in the delete file. Gone forever. And thankfully, Hernandez, Renario Hernandez, had a bad feeling about it and said, no, we're going to continue Dr. Mitchell's work. Thank well, God so that I, happened. I, I agree with you that, that it's a good thing it didn't it didn't go go forward. But I but I, I would say that I, I'm not sure I agree that they would be deleted. I, I think what they wanted is they wanted to suck that into their to, into their knowledge base. They because they're they're trying to build this massive database of of content that can be that can be easily um searched and mm -hmm. and i think i think i think they were hoping to basically pour you know put that data into their own data set which is going to be behind a, a you know they publicly state a, a proprietary algorithm um that means that you know that information is only going to be available if you yeah. query it through them no no i hey i fully understand that but the fact is we they didn't do it. Then there was the debate about disclosure versus confirmation, because they went back on the disclosure talk and came more about conversation confirmation. UFO history. I mean, we could thank the TTSA for literally the DNI report starting in two thousand four and not nineteen forty seven. <clears throat> and of course, the spooks part. No, everybody's I mean, a spook. To, to be honest with you, like. Um... To me, you know, like one of one of the most valuable lessons I learned in the uh, last big corporation I was in was was we really became to learn that it, it's it's really not about what you do. It's about how you do it. Yeah, that, that how you execute uh, matters far more than than the material material uh, situation that, that's at hand. Yeah. And if you really think about it, what what tom what tom got together uh, or or what tom got handed take your pick you know either way um was like one of the most phenomenal freaking opportunities that that anyone in this field could have ever hoped for right he was I mean, handed to, to have he was yeah, handed exactly. the ball on the on the 1 yard line yep okay and and, and, and no it was, defense it was in, and the team forgot to put out their entire defense and he couldn't run the ball into the end zone. It was, it was, and it wasn't even just one mistake. It was a series of repeated fumbles and misses. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, it was because the thing was, was that what they didn't realize was that several of the mistakes they made would come together to present a, a, a viewpoint. Because if you take the, 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 we're not UFO people, you take the fact that everyone in the company is spooks, you take the fact that they're not doing interviews, to take the fact that they're distancing themselves from experiencers, and suddenly 
they they look like the antithesis of of what anyone wants to happen like they mm-hmm. they made themselves look like the enemy and i don't even know if they intended to do that i i mean a part of me hopes they intended it because if they intended it then at least they did something you know correct but i don't think that was their intention at all and i think i think it was a perfect storm of mess ups that came together <laughs> to i mean essentially you you and, and to be okay to be fair like I, I've, like I said, I've been a part of several startups before, and this was a startup. Okay. This, in many ways, this was a, a classic California startup. And very often in the first couple of years, we completely change products, right? We'll be working on one product for a year and a half, and suddenly we'll realize we're building the wrong thing. And the VCs will come in and they'll go, but you know what? We like the team. We got a good engineering team here. We got a good management team here. You guys work well together. We want to we want to keep working with you. And so they'll put more money in and you start and you you grab what you can, you reuse it and you try again. And sometimes the product that you come out with, you know, three, four years later is nothing like what you thought you're going to be building when you first started that company. Right. So I get, I, I get how all that happens. Right. <clears throat> but normally that all happens undercover. You, you, yep. you're not talking to people while that's happening you keep all that you keep all that dirty laundry you you go when you go you're in stealth mode that's the whole point of stealth mode stealth mode mm-hmm. means you you don't have press you disappear for three four years then you hopefully show up with a product that works they were in stealth mode and tried to do pr and and i think what they part of what they did is they relied on tom to basically be the pr person because in fairness like his other companies have had a lot of, of social PR aspects to it and they seem to have done well. And so I think people gave them credibility for that. And essentially like, I mean, someday there, there will be a bit someday in a business school, this will be a case that people will study as an example of all the things you shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. I mean, just absolutely. But you know what? It sounds like, and I want to be fair here because in the end, we do have to be fair. It sounds like we're doing a lot of crapping on Tom DeLong and the TTSA. They did do some very good stuff. Okay. They got Absolutely. the media attention. They got it out of that Saturday filler spot at the at last end, last minute and a half of the newscast. And they brought it to the front page of the New York Times. They brought it to the f- top stories on, on Fox and CNN. That is incredible. They got people in Washington, D.C., politicians, elected officials talking about it. They got the military talking about it. Yep. If they I mean, let's have... face it, would we would we even would we have Elizondo? Would we have Chris Mellon? Would we would we, you know, would as many people know about about how put off and, and would know about, um, you know, I mean, they introduce. I mean, there's a lot of people in this community that are only with us because of what TTSA did. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you know, like me, for example, I, I had actually started researching it um, about a year and a half before, before TTSA came. But let me tell you, man, you know, like m- m- my engines got way more engaged after TTSA launched. Absolutely. And actually it was that first, it was that first uh, talk that Lou Elizondo gave in March after it so there's like march 2018 it was a it was a, a sc uh, i can't remember the name of the conference it was a conference that, that it was the first kind of technical conference that elizondo spoke at and it it was that conference what elizondo said at that conference that's what made me personally feel safe to start really talking publicly about this stuff before that i was very careful what i said I was very careful. I was very nervous. I was very, I was very cagey about what I said. So, you know, they do deserve a lot of credit for, for what they achieved. Um, It's just, it's very hard not to get frustrated because we all knew what they could have achieved. Right. We all know what they, we all, we all have a vision as to what they could have done. And it's hard not to look at that. But I mean, the thing is the UFO community uh, to put some of the blame on it, the UFO community didn't put enough pressure when TTSA started to pull away from them almost instantaneously. Okay. They didn't no. put enough pressure on this group. And, and, and Elizondo has stated publicly, it's the biggest mistake the TTSA made. 
was they forgot about the people. Mm -hmm. Right? They forgot about the people. Whether they're experiencers or whether they are, are um, amateur ufologists. They didn't just forget about them. They made them feel unwanted. Absolutely. They made them feel unwelcomed. Yeah. It was it was it was it was it was, it was tragic. It really was. In many to ways, this, it was, to it was, this it was day, tragic. To this day, when I and I don't talk to him often, okay. I'm not trying to say that I talk to Lou Elizondo once a week or even once a month. But to this day, Lou still apologizes to me for not coming on the show previous. Yep. No, and, and what's horrible is that that I've seen Lou talk about this. He really, I mean, it's not just, he's not just trying to make amends. He honestly feels bad about it. He really does. I mean, it yeah. sucks because I, I, I don't even know how aware he was. I don't even know how aware he was. He didn't know. Going on. He didn't but, know because I mean, under their contract, um, under their contract with, with TTSA, Carrie DeLong, Tom's sister, ran the PR department. And yep. what uh, when they signed the NDAs for the TT and their contracts with the TTSA, in that agreement, it stated that all press coverage is to go through Carrie DeLong. Yep. And according to according to Lou, uh, that he has said on interviews is that uh, he actually approached Carrie and said, "Where are all these podcasts? Where are all these shows about UFOs that I hear about?" And they're not calling to interview us, and Carrie never really answered the question. And then all of a sudden, when Lou and them leave, and and his floodgates open with literally hundreds, you know, not ten or twenty, but hundreds of interview requests immediately, he was like, "Oh my god." And you know, there, there's someone, I don't remember who it is, but there's someone on Twitter that's been keeping an Excel spreadsheet of all of Lou Elizondo's appearances since since he got out of TTSA. And let me tell you, that is a long damn list. <laughs> like it is astounding oh, how many places he he went and talked. And and he and he poured himself into those talks. I mean, he really did. A lot of them are long form, you know, two hour plus talks. I mean, it, it's uh it, it's it, it he's he's basically he's basically been been trying to make up for for all of yeah. it you know and um no you ab know absolutely but you know what the public you know like let, let's bring it into the focus for this interview here because uh meaty toes on twitter uh was asking about was asking about how does this this guy from toronto okay all of a sudden, get Jim Semivan and Tom DeLong. How does this happen? Right? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> they're not the biggest UFO show out there. All right? And this isn't an insult to, to this show. Not an insult whatsoever. But in typical DeLong fashion... He went to someone who was going to throw him a bunch of a bunch of softballs and do an interview that way. That's the way it happened. Well, I mean, I mean the, the, that that professor, he's he's professor UC San Diego. So he's right in Tom's neck of the woods, right? I mean, you know, he's um, you know, that you know, that's that's his home, that's his hometown. Um but, but why would Jim Semivan all of a sudden come out from the forest and do an interview? All right. Yeah, I mean, no. the The thing is, is it is it my understanding is that um, uh, Doctor Brian Keating he he knew he knew both Tom and Jim, and and he he he's known them for a while, and 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 actually considers them friends. Oh, so I don't great. know under what capacity he's interacted with them in the past, but but you know, I I think what we're getting down to is that. You know, as you and I have talked about at other points, you know, there's this really unfortunate thing that's going on right now where essentially it's like this it's like this whisper network. 
And essentially people who, who, who know the right people, they, they've made friends with the right people. They're able to kind of reach out to this whisper network and, you know, they're able to get these you know crazy interviews and often it ends up, it ends up being on, on, you know, channels that, you know, um, you know, I mean, you take, for example, um, Kurt, I mean, you know, his, he just started doing this like a year ago, you know, and hey, Chris like, I mean, he, he's pulled some, I mean, of his top 11 biggest interviews since he started this channel, six of them are, are UFO people. Yeah. Right. And, and, and they have huge numbers, huge, huge numbers. And good for right? him. Good for him. But how you know, did he, the, you know, how did he get those interviews? Like, how did that happen? And why did he get those interviews? It's, it's weird. It's weird the way it works. Absolutely. But I mean, you know, the fact is, Tom, wh whoever did the interview isn't, isn't, that isn't the issue. Okay. The issue is, and the issue is this. If you are going to, if you are going to go on a podcast, Tom, there are dozens of UFO podcasts out there. That, and by the way, Dan W, thank you so much for that incredible super chat. Really appreciate it. You all, you do this every month, and thank you so much. That's that's just way too kind of you, way too kind. Thank you, buddy. Um, if you look at at um, um, the interviews that Tom has done, there's no hard questions, mm -mm. right? There is no hard questions, and somebody needed to ask Tom some hard questions. But the good part about Tom with his position and his popularity, he he doesn't have to answer tough questions. Mm -hmm. The hardest questions Tom has had to ans answer in the last 20 years is why did he leave Blink-182? Yep. That's it. He never had to answer a tough question about UFOs. No, and actually, you know what? There was there was one question asked today, or, or uh, uh, just the other day when this was done, that I, I thought was was good and that was it's um a, i think it was kurt asked you know the, the in at one point uh tom talked about something he learned that that really shook him up that really like really like changed his whole perspective on things and really really made him made him see the 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 danger or the risk in in this whole thing and uh and and Kurt asked him, what, what was that? And, and Tom just immediately was like, well, I'm not going to talk about that. And, and like went on to something else. I mean, it was like, it was actually kind of funny. It was, it was, so Kurt did try once and, and Tom just like, but like you said, it's Tom DeLong. So, you know, I mean, he can, you know, he can, you know, I mean, he can get away with a whole lot of stuff. No. And, and I understand that. And I can appreciate that rock star status, dude has a lot of privileges a lot of privileges people in the music world get a lot of breaks and a lot of information because you know what i i have a buddy named jamie who lives in in texas been in the music industry and seen <clears throat> since the hair band days of the 80s all right and him and I had a talk, oh, probably three years ago about this, yeah, right when the TTSA had come out, because I was talking to him about this. And he he's like, Dave, you have to remember that people who are secret agents, government officials, they all love music. And how they work their way into... Um, how they work their way in to get get uh, these rock stars get uh, the this information is look a guy like Mark Warner or or the head of uh, of Lockheed Skunk Works if they know that Tom has a, a a love of UFOs they can request tickets and say hey we'd like to meet with Tom after the after the uh, after the show. Because there's always an after party after every concert. It's it's rock and roll protocol. I well, mean, these guys how... don't these guys don't get off stage and all of a sudden say good night. We're heading home to bed. 
they're partying and, and hanging out till three, four, five in the morning. Well, that's how it. that's how this whole thing started. That that's how I mean that's how the whole thing at Lockheed started was basically they were they were doing a, a very unusual family event at Lockheed where you know for once in a long while people actually got to bring their families onto you know one of the campuses and basically the the president of Lockheed was going to be giving a, a giving a speech and someone you know a friend of a friend of a friend from because they all live in the ba- in the same area basically knew Tom and basically asked Tom if he would introduce the that's the if president you, but that's and, if and that's how that meeting started to happen that's if you buy the story and the narrative that that's the way it happened i don't think for a second that that's the way it played out oh really not a second think okay. about it all right you okay. have a major rock star who sings about aliens and ufos very public about it he has 3 million followers on twitter 3 million on on Instagram and they're thinking how do we get this message to the young people cuz they don't care about us old bastards and I'm uh, and I'm adding you up in that group too <laughs> anybody over 35 they don't care about you know why we're still religious we're still we question too much there's an entire generation below us that is more interested in clickbait and being offended than they are about actually gaining actual knowledge. All right. They're not into heavy news. They're into the 24 hour news cycle where, Hey, there's UFOs here. And by the way, new Barbie doll has just been released. That's what the, the generation is into. That's why you've seen news cycles they, like CNN grew up in a 24 hour news cycle. CNN and Fox, what they've done is they've really catered to that clickbait crowd. Let's hit you quick. Let's hit you hard. And let's get on to the next story. Right? <clears throat> Remember, we're dealing with this. We're dealing with, with generations that do everything in 280, uh, 280 uh, Character. Uh, clicks or words or probably letters on Twitter and hashtags than they are about investigating where a story come from. I don't buy the DeLong story uh, for a heartbeat. Uh, B. Hoff, my, my shirt is from uh, the gun store in Las Vegas because uh, that's the first and only place I've ever fired machine guns. Yeah, that's fun, man. I shot an Uzi. That was crazy. I never got it. I, I shot an AK-47, an MP5. Oh, the MP5 is fun, yeah. Oh, that was, and I, and I yeah. did a shotgun. Uh, I was really upset when I saw what the price of was the ammo for the Tommy gun. I really wanted to shoot the Tommy gun, but my God, that ammo was so bloody expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, they needed a way to get into, to, to get okay, into so, the Okay, so I want to make sure I understand this. So so you think that before before Tom got invited to that event, that it there was, was all. That there was already a group that was looking for a way to yes. to release this, and and Tom came along, and they went, you know, oh, you know, kind of well, like long the spider sort of thing. He had the followers, okay. If they needed him to go on tour musically and talk some UFOs to people while on stage playing songs with angels and airwaves, he could do that, <clears throat> okay. Then if you go a little bit deep, and this is just my, my surmise. Sure, sure, sure. Yep. Okay. Do I have proof of this? Not at all. But this is in be- reading in between the lines of everything. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. All right. <clears throat> because, look, if you're putting together a UFO power group, how does 75% of your team be part of Robert Bigelow's team. Well, now, okay. Now the one thing, the, the, so the two <clears> things <throat> I would add is that one, one way to, to kind of flush out your hypothesis would be to look into um, uh, what was that? What was that pl- crazy place called a uh, inner NASA or, or, or uh, uh, the, 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 the previous t- uh, to the stars Academy, the um, with um, um, uh, where they had the, um, the the rotating um uh, well you had him. nids if you look yeah. at the team of nids bass 
Uh, Joe Firmage, I think it was. Yeah. But if he you was, look I, at the teams before that, okay, that Robert Bigelow put together, 75% of Tom's team were Bigelow cronies at one point yeah, or another. Yeah. No, and, and that's the thing is that when, when that, when that, including Elizondo, including Elizondo. Including Elizondo, Elizondo worked at Skinwalker Ranch. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Through because of because of the because of the the contract because of the yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, and but no. It, the one thing I was going to say is that if we if we look and see at what point did Hal put off distance himself from Inner NASA and the Joe Firmage that whole that whole thing, if if the timing of that came right before the the Tom's uh, invitation to Lockheed. Then that would mean they were looking for a new, a new target. They were looking for a new. Absolutely, a, a because new Bigelow had done nothing. Bigelow had done nothing up. That would be a way to test for it for a couple of years. Test it. No, Don't forget, but he had quietly sold. He had quietly sold Skinwalker Ranch to Brandon Fugel in 2016. Right. All right. He was out of the game. He was out of the game. Well, yeah, because I, because I, my opinion, I, I don't think I, I, I think Bigelow was only ever there to answer his own questions. Yeah, absolutely. Bigelow had a set of questions that he he needed to answer, and that that's all he wanted. And there's a story. It, everything else that. was a side effect. Oh yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I mean, all of it has to do with his his, his son. It's, it's actually a sad story, but um, and then he lost his wife as well. But the one thing I would add is that, and the part we can't forget is that. The team that Tom ended up with was, was the B team because was, the A team he lost as a result of the WikiLeaks release. The yes. original team of people he had included vanished on him, and 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 and, it, and include it included the the person he used to refer to as the general, right? So so basically, you know, that was the original team. They got outed in that in the WikiLeaks email. They vanished. And when they vanished, this new team approached Tom and said, "Hey, we'd like to do this with you." You know, and Think about it. I, you know, I was always that part. I was always a little suspicious about because it seemed like it was a little opportunistic. You know, uh, that 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 Tom was now without a team and still wanted to do something, and suddenly a, a B team showed up, and they were, they all knew each other, and they were ready to go. But that's why um, that, that's that was why worrisome. it was interesting. That's why it was interesting that nobody from the UFO community, and there are some brilliant people in there. Okay, nobody from the UFO community was in there. Okay, there was no. You got to realize how do you put together a power team of UFO UFO people without Stanton Friedman? How do you do that? Or even God, Dolan, you know, for that matter. Dave, you know what's really hard, man? Is, is oh God, you know people are going to hate me for saying this, but you know, if if uh, Hi, Mark, if if I were if I were if I were putting together that team, I don't know if I would take anybody that you're talking about. That's you know? fine and dandy. That's fine uh, and dandy. But remember. They were there's so much baggage that comes with all those people. I mean, there's there's so much baggage, and you're trying to build a company, and, you know. So it's like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't even know. I don't even know what I would like. If like, I mean, like like Richard Dolan is someone that I might I might consider, but I don't even know what role I'd put him in. I mean, if, if I'm building a company, I need to hire people that are going to be doing something. No, you know, they okay. actually like they, they have a role. Peter Davenport. Look, we as can throw advisor, we, we can advisor. we can throw names out there left, right, and center. Let's also remember that they didn't even invite any scientists part of the SCU, the Scientific Coalition for now UAP that, Studies. That that that, okay? that I will completely. They didn't with invite anyone. anybody. That was worrisome. That and, was worrisome. And, and, and how it, speaks at those conferences? But but here's the other thing too, okay? If you look at the entire group, for years people have been told point blank, okay, don't trust the spooks. Richard Doty himself came out and said, "Don't trust the spooks in this field." 
because there's disinformation agents. Now, I'm not saying Lou is a disinformation agent. I think Lou, I, I really like Lou Elizondo. I really do. I was weary of him at first, but my attitude changed on that, okay? And I and I will be the first one to admit it. All right. So when you have when you have um uh a team full of spooks whose job was to go be in everything from remote viewing to psychological warfare to covering up the UFO subject, denial of the UFO subject, hiding the UFO subject, all working for the same man who bought into MUFON, who went out and spent money on buying UFO research sites. I'm going to show you something right here. This is a Canadian website, okay? A Canadian website. Uh Okay. was owned by a guy named Brian Vike, who lives in a small town called Houston, British Columbia, which is about uh, hold on. Yeah, I agree. Dolan would have outed them in a second. Sorry, just respond to a comment in the post. <laughs> hey, it looks like uh, hold on. Maybe the site was taken down. Uh, I'm wondering if the site was taken down. But, you know, Dave, this is why there, I mean, there are certain real hardcore skeptics that, that think the entire UFO community, the whole thing is just one gigantic scam. And they, they'll point to a lot of things you're pointing at and go, look, th this person knows. Do you remember that? God, what was that slide that Leslie, uh, that, um, uh, that um, Melinda Leslie did in one of her presentations? She has this magnificent slide that shows all the people and where they worked. And, and she has boxes checked off in all the places. And you can see over time. Like the 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 movement of the same people through all the different organizations. It's actually it's really crazy the work she did on that. And it, it it's hard because like from one point of view, that looks incredibly suspicious, right? Like, why are the same people showing up? The flip side is, right, that if I'm trying to build a startup and and I'm trying to build a rocket, a new rocket startup, okay there's a certain group of people I'm going to hire from. Right. right. And, and you're, and when I do <clears throat> another startup, I grab a lot of the same people that I worked with in my last startup because okay. I know them and but, I trust them. But let me, let me finish my thought here. Please. Hey, okay, Brian Vike, I try, and this is how I caught on to this. And when I started spaced out radio, I could, I, I wanted to bring a real North American flavor to, the the show okay yeah because your accent's really hard to handle sometimes thank you i appreciate that <laughs> anyways um and i wanted to find some canadian ufologists outside of grant cameron and the eastern people like being in british columbia here and right. i came through google i came across brian vike <clears throat> i emailed brian vike he said look due to my health and everything i am no longer um, I am no longer in the UFO game, but thank you. I'm done. Oh, okay. All right. Not a problem. Right. However, there is a problem because if you go back in history and the site is now down, I was going to show you guys the site, a Brian Vike's UFO reporting site, which was hbccufo.org, which stands for Houston, British Columbia, Canada, ufo.org in the about section showed that they uh, a company called BAASS thanked Brian Vike for all of his hard years and dedication to UFO research and that the Bass team Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Space Systems would be taking over all the reports 
Okay. So <clears throat> Bigelow bought UFO sites with that $22 million that he got from the government. He bought into MUFON and he started buying up UFO websites. Interesting. Okay. Somewhere there's a screenshot of that. Now, I had heard through some sources that Vite got paid as low as $850 and as high as like $150 grand from, from uh, um, Bigelow. And that also included all the reports. So in the meantime... People were contacting HB uh, Brian Vike's website, giving them their name, their phone number, their email address, their personal address. And all that information went into the hands of Bigelow Aerospace. Well, Hal, eventually he got it, he got the reporting number changed to his number. People when when people would call in things, it would bring up Bigelow. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, Bigelow also during that time with the 22 million, I, and I'm not sure if these two are tied together, but at one point, every UFO report into the FAA, in the FAA handbook, it showed that if you see an unidentified flying yeah, object, you call. report it to, Big, to Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Space Systems. Yep. Yep. And I, and honestly, if I remember correctly, I don't even know if it declares it's Bigelow. I think they give you a phone number. And if you call that number, you would find out that it was Bigelow. So I'm not even sure because yes. he was doing that on behalf of the government. Yeah, of course he was. They were collecting names. They were collecting anything. So, 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 here's, I, so, so but here's the, here's the thing just real quick, because there's two different, there's two different ways to look at this. If, if I'm trying to get my hands on, on what's going on in this whole phenomenon, right? Yeah. Like all I was able to do was, was read freaking like, I don't know how many I'm up to now, like 60, 70 books or something like that. that that's all I could do. Cause that's the only thing I had access to. If, if I had money, what I would have liked to have done would have been to do what you just described would be to go around and buy copies of everybody's database of reports and incidents and experiencers and abductions and everything, grab all of that data, put it into one database, write a proper front end to it and mine that database to get my answers. Absolutely. So, so that, but, I mean, that's actually, hold on a second here. If you take the HBCC website that Bigelow had bought or MUFON, how would you feel if your private report that you, oh, report, I know. that you sent yeah. to a private site has yeah. now fallen into the hands. Your private yeah. information has fallen into the hands of a government, a, fit, a government black project business. Yep. 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 Or a government and, contract. And, and, I'll, and, and I'll, but so, I'll, I'll say this, I agree with you, but I'll say this, that, that I, I don't, oh man, you know, I, I wouldn't want to shut down any people doing this, but I have to admit, like, I, I've never understood why anyone thought that any one of these groups could actually protect could actually protect their anonymity. Because one of the nasty things, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but one of the nasty things about US business law is that if any organization goes bankrupt, the the court manager will sell all the assets to try to recover as much money as they can to pay back the debtors. And in every single bankruptcy case in America, the contact list, the customer list, the research list of all the people that that company worked with is sold in auction to the highest bidder. And you have absolutely no rights. Like if <coughs> no, I, you're in I, bankruptcy, man, I, 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 you know, I just want to quickly say uh, just a couple things. Uh, um, Thank you, Logan, for coming back in. JR, what about the guy from Secure Team 10? Um, he could go do his own thing. You know, uh, I, I don't... Yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that and bite my tongue on Secure Team 10. But uh, just... Yeah. I don't think it's right to support people who, A, do a lot of CGI 
and B, uh, who are <laughs> convicted uh, people. Yeah. With. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Dark. We'll leave it at that. It's just dark. Uh, Apollo Eleven. I uh, Dan Aykroyd is extremely hard to get. I've been trying for years to get him, and I did. Who, to who, try who and did get him? He did an interview with someone a while ago that was really good. Oh, I think it was Joe Rogan. Yeah. I think it was Joe Rogan. That was a good interview. I had no idea. I had no clue how into this topic he oh, was. GFG is asking, uh, why now? What's next? This is what I think is next. Uh, I find it extremely interesting that Sean Cahill has gone absolutely silent. I think that, uh, that we got to figure out that reasoning because wherever Lou went, Sean was right there and I like Sean and Sean is a good man. And hopefully I can, uh, get that out of him, at least the public story out of him. Um, yeah, you know, a quick a quick point on that. You know, the one thing I'm curious about is is right before he vanished, he did a couple interviews, and in those interviews, he got he got really thoughtful, and he he shared a lot of really personal views on things. Oh yeah, and and then he vanished afterwards. And what I'm curious about is is it. Is this just is this is this just him needing personal time because he got to a, a uh, I know an he needed personal point. time, uh, or is it like PJ because PJ Hughes right is another one who was very active. He was talking a lot to us. He was sharing a lot of information, and he vanished. And he just recently came back. And his reason for vanishing is different. His reason for vanishing is that he said too much. Yeah, and. He got and, and to. he had to he he had to back off, right? Yeah. So it's hard to know exactly what happened with with well, Cahill. I know what happened. You know, was with it all Sean. him, or was it? I know what happened you... with Sean. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, right. Sean told me because Sean okay. and I, Sean and I have developed a a really good kinship. I, you know, I He's I, I don't want to call it a, a a friendship because you got to remain professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay. Yeah, he's, but, he's but a good like kinship. Him. And um, let's just say, without getting into any drama, that uh, Sean is not too happy for a long time with UFO Twitter because yep. there was an incident. And that's his story to tell. Yep. If, if he chooses to tell it. Yep. Uh, but it really made him need to back off for a while. It had nothing to do with government. Uh, it had everything to do with UFO Twitter and uh, some of the things that were happening there. And that's where uh, I'll leave it. That's his story to tell, not mine. Yep. And, you know, uh, but getting back to GF, 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 G's uh, point uh, about where do we go from here? What we're seeing right now, in my opinion, is an absolute mess of the field. Everybody is scrounging. For, uh, we're like a bunch of uh, rats scrounging for uh, breadcrumbs that a a restaurant just threw in the back alley. Like a, a chef, threw, you know, missed the dumpster and landed on the ground, and now the rats are scrambling to grab every little piece of it. I mean, you have the guys from UAPX, they have their focus on, on that is trying to recreate the Nimitz mm -hmm. incident. They're doing some very interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Hi, Ethereum, very Aura, how are stuff. you? You have now the Galileo Project. I think that if, if I were to encourage my listeners to watch two things, okay, and this is no disrespect to anybody on, uh, on Twitter on or any other project or media project or podcast or anything. Okay. The only two things that I am personally focusing on right now is the Galileo project. Number one, but that with the addition of Seth Stoshak, I really do believe that 
that could turn ugly and fail quite miserably. Or number two, the second per, uh, part that I would follow in all of this would be, oh shoot, I just had it. There was Galileo Project and what's the other one? My mind just went blank. <laughs> well, uh, let me just say something real quick about Galileo. Maybe you can remember what you were going to say. Yeah. And that is that the one of the, the one of the most important things about the Galileo project that I, I hope everyone's catching on to is is what what they're getting at is the same thing that that Lou's talked about and a lot of us have talked about, and that is that when when you record video on a cell phone in an airplane, it's a hell of a lot easier to get that out than anything recorded with an official government camera. Because the thing is, is that the only way you can release that data is if you clean the, the you clean the data, you clean the, the the footage that comes from the gun camera or or the pod. Once you've manipulated that data, it's not useful to scientists anymore. They don't mm -hmm. want to touch it with a ten foot pole. It, it, oh, it, yes. It's neutered its its value, right? So it's yeah. only this phone phone stuff that's useful. Well, that's not a great yeah. way to do it. And so one of the big things about the Galileo project is 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 Avi Loeb wants to build wants to build hardware he wants to build no, devices i, I, get, to I get that i and get that public but... hardware so it'll be public access data and that's a big deal the other the part two is in my opinion ross coltart yes the australian investigative journalist award-winning yes. journalist we just had him on the show a couple weeks ago and i really do believe that the two pro the two things to watch right now is what is Ross Coltart going to do? All right. Let's remember he's a real journalist. He's not one of these fake ones who self-titled themselves. He's not a blogger who's decided to call themselves a UFO journalist. You know, um, there, and if Ross can stay clean and I'm not saying, uh, Leslie Keen or Ralph Blumenthal or George Knapp, are dirty in any of this. I'm not saying that at all. I respect all three of them wholeheartedly yep. And, yep. and their journalistic endeavors. Yep. Okay. Yep. But, but Ross Coltart is coming yep. after the cold, hard facts. He has no skin in the game. Yep. Okay. He's coming at this fresh, yep. new, new it, question. It helps that he's from another country. It really does. It, he's, he's not he's afraid coming, to yep. ask the tough questions. Yep. And in my opinion, if Ross, if Russ Coltheart is as serious about this topic as he says he is, and it's really, really hit him, I would love to see Coltheart build up a team of, of journalists and scientists, real journalists. I'm not saying that those yep. who play the role for the sake yep. of UFO Twitter or yep. the sake of uh, and you can see it you can see the difference in the way he does things absolutely it, it's, it's it's a, it's a he, whole different level hey preston deckett how beckett how are you buddy uh but if 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 because he's going to need some help eventually he's going to need some help you know like i would love to see him team up with somebody like bryce zabel oh yeah okay yeah bryce zabel yeah, does some that would be great work has hollywood connections and I think Ross Coldheart is sitting on some incredible information, like Steam Train Mark just said. Hi, Mark Sanchez. All right. And I think that that if he set up a proper journalism team with you know with oh, wouldn't that be cool? That that wouldn't is that where be cool. That is what I think with some proper scientists, okay, who have not maybe not knowledge of UFOs, but knowledge of how government works oh, man. Or, you know, or whatever. God. I think Ross Cold Ross Coldheart, in my opinion, is the man who can bring true disclosure to journalism and the world. You know, you 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 probably put together. You could probably do it with maybe six to ten people to start, and you you put the right people behind Ross, and and he could be a force. He could be a force of nature. He really could. 
Yeah. You really the one per, the other person I will I will add to this, and and it's not for all that he does. It's it's just for some of what he does. But I really think that uh, I really think that Danny Sheehan someone that you got to keep an eye on. Um, you, because but, but you got to realize though, okay. Here here's the and I like Daniel Sheehan. I'll always make time for him on the air. But we also have to remember that Danny is very much like like um steve bassett they're playing political sides this is a non-political event it's an apolitical event and ufos is not about politics it's not about republican it's not about democrat up here in canada it's not about conservatives or liberals or new democrats it's about everybody it's not yeah, a you socialist know, like the, thing. It's not a capitalism the, thing. So I, 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 I completely agree with you, and and I specifically see this whole topic as a as a silver bullet in the in the fraction that exists in the U.S. Yeah. right now. I think it's an opportunity to bring them together. The one thing I will say, though, in in Danny's defense, is that you know what, what I what I like about Danny is that he's 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 like a he's like a bulldog. Absolutely. When, when he bites 100%. into something, he doesn't let go. And yeah. he has been at the forefront of ex what, what he loves the most is exposing government yes. cover ups. Absolutely. He doesn't, he doesn't actually you care can very talk much to the audience. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I honestly, dude, I'm about to bust here. I'll be right back. <laughs> no, go right ahead. Go right ahead. But all I'm going to say is that, is that he, he, he will, it, it, he, he gets a passion for something. He gets a passion for civil rights. He gets a passion for, you know, uh, drug corruption. He gets a passion for, um, you know, I mean, God, the work he's done in some of these things. And if he really sinks his teeth into this, he's not going to let go. And he will just, he will bite and bite and bite and bite and bite. And there's a really good chance that he'll shake something out. And yeah, I know, I know some of you are, you know, it makes you a little nervous, you know, his involvement with, um, with, uh, 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 you know, Dr, you know, Dr. Muscles. And, uh, and I know, um, you know, um, you know, there's different feelings about Mark Sims and so forth and, and there's different feelings about the CE5 stuff, but, but, but set that, set that personal stuff aside and, and look at what, you know, what he's doing on the legal side, what he's doing with the, with the inspector general and, um, you know, uh, Danny, Dan oh man, that guy, um, you know, he's, 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 he's a beautiful, he's a, he's a beautiful lawyer. Yeah, I can see it. I'm watching you. Assuming it actually updates. Hey, man, we appreciate those of you that are actually sticking with us. No man, it's one what one one thirty? It's one thirty here. Can't imagine what time it is for some of you. No, you're right. Dave Dave takes this very, very personally, and it means a lot. And um he's he, he, has, he does a good job of, of hiding it usually, but he has strong feelings and, and it's he, he's got a lot of passion. It's good. God, you know, man, I got to be honest with y'all. I, I really struggle. I really struggle with the reptilians. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I believe experiencers. I take them for what they say. I haven't been there. I wasn't with them. I have no idea, you know, what, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to judge someone's personal experience, but man, when, when people start talking about giant, 
mantis things and and all this stuff oh boy <laughs> i struggle i really do it's hard for me i don't know what i would do if i if i if a six foot tall mantis started talking to me i i think i would just start laughing i, I don't think i could control myself i just can't even imagine And like, why do some people see reptiles and some people see little grays and some people see this and some people see that? I mean, are, are they all just the same thing and they're just presenting to us what they what they think we're going to like the best? What, what What's going to scare us the least? So I, I'm not, okay. So as, as much as I love Everett, I'm, I'm not a big fan of um, the, the multiverse model that some people prescribe to as far as everything being um, replicated. However, I, I think that there is actually some evidence for um, other independent dimensions existing. And, um, I think that, um, you know, I'll repost it later, but I have this, I have this great app for my phone that allows you to see, um, uh, radio, um, uh, radio signals, um, you know, all over the, um, you know, all over the area you're in. And, and unfortunately it's done from databases. It's not real time, but, um, you know, and I, I doubt, I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see it, but, but basically um, you can see like, you know, all these overlapping um, radio networks, like overlapping them each other right there. It, it's really hard to see on my phone. I apologize. It's, it's called the architecture of radio. And I, I think there's a good chance that that's what we're talking about, that essentially all these places overlap. They're all in the same location. And we're like a radio and we're just tuned into the set of frequencies that represent this reality. And there are other beings that are tuned into a different frequency and we're all existing in the same space. And there's some people that can listen to a wider band of radios than other people, radio signals than other people can. And as you change your vibration, maybe you can see, I, I think that's completely possible, but I, you know, I don't have any evidence for it, but yeah. I, I think it's totally possible. Well, I mean, like, sorry for, I, I know I'm hopping way back here. Um, you know, in oh, regards well, to one quick question. No, I haven't really gotten into the Vedas yet, and it's something I need to do. Sorry, like get, getting back to um, what I was saying about about uh, you know who to watch, which I said Ross Coulthard and and the uh, Galileo, Galileo project. This, I don't. I want to make it sure that I mean this isn't an insult to the work of Danny Sheehan. Or Lou Elizondo, I, I you all obviously have to keep an eye on what Elizondo and Mellon are doing too. I mean that's only obvious. But I think on the on the bigger sense of everything, we really need to also understand that media outlets, whether it's shows like Coast to Coast or Jimmy Church or myself, or media outlets like the Debrief, all we're doing is reporting on the scraps that we are that are thrown out there yes we need to start concentrating more never mind of of, of splitting up the podcast because now there's about you know three thousand ufo podcasts out there and i don't even think i'm exaggerating on that number <laughs> okay um what we need to do is we need to start gaining as a community gaining focus it's not about the conferences or the technology in the conferences or or who's getting what information who's or the television shows or whatever um it's it's literally it's literally about in my opinion focusing on two or three different categories of where is the information coming from? So yeah, I should add Mellon and Elizondo to that list. But here's the other thing we have to realize too. Elizondo has been going hard. He doesn't want to touch the UFO question or the the extraterrestrial the, question. The alien, I think yeah. we have yep. a I think we have a a time limit with Elizondo. 
I would it wouldn't surprise me if within two years Elizondo walks completely away from this subject. Would I'll, not I'll surprise go further. me whatsoever. I, I hope he does. I as much as I like that guy, and I haven't had a chance to meet him personally, but I I, I have to admit I have a good I I I, I you know I, I like him from a distance. But this this what he's doing that you burn out fast, right? And and this is a man who's already spent most of his career away from his family. So, you know, I, I would completely encourage Mr. Elizondo to exit stage Absol- left absolutely. sometime soon. You know, but I, I mean, mean, Elizondo isn't the guy who's going to take us into the aliens, wherever they're from. If they're from inner earth, if they're from a different dimension, or if they're from outer space, Elizondo is not that guy. He doesn't want to be that guy. Yeah, no, no. But I'll, so, but I'll say, I'll, but I'll, I'll say this day. I, I don't even, I, my so one of the things that I've been really enjoying about the last say 18 months is all the new blood that showed up, right? All the new people like Ross, right? Like I I mean think about it. Back in uh Ross back is in a January, gem. Well, Ross back is in a January, gem. I mean I, I had a friend of mine from the UK message me about this guy Ross, and he's like, You're not gonna believe this guy, this guy is gonna be <clears> huge. And I was like what? Like, what are you talking about? Right. It took like three months for it to happen. Like my friend was dead on. Right. Ross is, is awesome. But here's the thing. Like there's Eric Weinstein, right? Eric, Eric Weinstein Weinstein's is, another one. Is, a, is a brilliant guy who didn't have, any, who had nothing to do with this stuff up until now. Right. Right. And now he's pissed. He's mad that, that the community of, of, of smart, you know, smarter than the average bear people that he runs with, that are, are, that are actually the capability of solving real problems haven't been working on this problem, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And I think there's a good chance that the, the people that really take the ball, you know, go back to a, a, a sports analogy, which I'll be honest here, not a sports guy, so I may mess this up. Uh, but, you know, if you look at, you know, who's going to take it, you know, down the line, I think there's a really good chance that we're looking at a, a, a multi-year, multi-phase thing and the people that are going to take us down the road later, the people that are going to really help us make leaps later, we haven't even met yet. Okay, so let, let's let's look at the tips, okay? We've heard Elizondo say uh, very ominously, phase one, phase two. Yeah. Okay? And nobody really knows what he means. We have speculation. Yes. But I'm going to tell you what my sources have told me. Phase one was getting it in front of the media and getting the conversation happening, stirring it up in Washington. Phase two was getting the U- basically getting the UAPTF to go public. All right. And, and to get support. And you know, get, eliminate. Get government support. Eliminate the words Russia and China. Yes. And foreign yes. adversaries. Yes. We saw that all of a sudden later on in interviews, Mellon and and uh, Elizondo were both no longer mentioning China or Russia. And Leslie the- went hard against that in her article on the debrief the other day. Yeah. She, she went we she went hard. She she brought quotes from um from uh, 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 Mitt Romney and uh, and someone else, you know, saying point blank, you know, it, it is a foregone okay. conclusion. This is not so, this is not foreign technology. So the next phase is phase three, which is the big one, which is still a couple years away from what I'm hearing. And phase three is, ladies and gentlemen, we have contact now. I will stand by my, with zero proof, I will stand by my original thought that I said about a month and a half ago, which is, which is that I think contact was made. And that's why we saw all of a sudden this rush and this push. Because if you remember about six months ago, it, 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 it didn't really take off, but a lot of people were using it. Hashtag why now? Why now? Why all of a sudden is it important over the last three years to get the UFO story out after 70 years of cover-up? 
doesn't make sense. The only logical reason that comes out of this, or actually the only two logical reasons are this. Number one, and I don't believe this one, that Stephen Greer is right and that there is an alien false flag coming, event happening. I don't buy that whatsoever. Or number two, they got a phone call from another dimension or from space or wherever saying, we're coming. This is when we're going to be here. And you better start now preparing. So, so I will, I will offer one more possibility and, and another possibility is that, that perhaps we have made contact and, and, and I have to admit, I, I think that there, uh, I think that there's, there's evidence that either we are aware that contact is possible or we've already made it. But here's the thing. We can't assume that it's one party. We can't assume it might be. But we cannot assume that it's, it's one individual organization off planet that everyone's communicating with. And so I think it's possible that we have communicated with more than one. Yeah. I think it's also possible that other countries have communicated with more than one. I think it's also possible that there are members, there are groups that other countries have communicated with that we have not. And those that we've communicated that other people have not. And this scares me. I don't I don't want to end up being the South, you know, the North and South Korea in someone else's proxy battle. Right. So yeah, I, I, think I that understand there, that there's a chance of that. But I think the other pressure that that is coming, it's possible that those contacts were made a long time ago and and we can control when that happens. I think the other problem that was occurring is the U.S. is moving the business, the U.S. business world into space. It is, but and here... and that was going to create a certain amount of pressure from the point of view of now you're going to have a lot of people working in orbit and working between here and Mars, and they're going to start seeing stuff and they're going to start asking questions. And so I think that was another a, another direction of pressure. Could how in, how important it was, I have no <clears throat> idea, but I think that was another factor. But this is what I think. I think a date was given because here's the thing. The younger generations, that 30 and younger crowd right now, they're open up, opening up and have opened up to a lot more possibilities in this world than we can imagine. I look at my own kids, dude. My own kids don't even question, never mind because of what I do, but they don't even question whether or not there's life out in space or there's aliens. Yep. They don't question it. Okay. Yep. We, we have to remember this. Over four and a half billion people on this planet still pray to a religious deity. Most of those religious deities say anything coming from an unnatural world outside of ours is demonic, is satanic, and they are scared. Guess what? The In the next 30 years, the majority of those people will be dead. Mm -hmm. They will be dead. Mm -hmm. through natural causes or whatever, mm -hmm. their lives are going to be over. Mm -hmm. They don't care, okay? The government doesn't care about the people like my parents who are in their 70s. They don't care about the people who are in their 60s, their 50s, and even many in the 40s, like you and mm -hmm. I. What they care about is that 30 and younger crowd who is going to be just fine with little Sally and little Jimmy walking around, going to elementary school with Auk the Grey from Zeta Reticuli. Have you seen that that video that someone made? of the? Uh, there was like, I think it was like a fake UN video that shows an alien kid going to school? No. Oh, I'll find it and I'll send it to you. It's crazy. It, I don't know who made that, it, but it's it's crazy. That's the big thing, guy. That And for our audience, that's the big thing. And I would suggest that anywhere between the next five and 30 years, all right, between ne the next five and 30 years is where we're going to see this happen. I, I and I, I will, I will, I, I, I'm not confident enough to put a year on it, but I will say that, that my, my daughter, who's, who will be, she'll be six in October. 
that that someday in her in her lifetime she will she will work with people who are not from earth yeah she she will she will she will share work too with 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 people but but here but here's one of my big questions right so i started researching this stuff in about 2015 so let me tell you when 2017 happened i was like oh wow did i jump in this at the right time uh and uh but i avoided uh the abduction topic until about a year ago and i did so on purpose because i I knew it would trigger me to to a certain degree and it has and um, the abduction phenomenon, whatever it is, um, it, it's a challenging thing. And I don't see how they can go to a phase that introduces off-world entities and, and tries to acclimate them to our society that's without a- addressing the abduction but problem. that's But that's part of the secret problem. This is why that DNA report is garbage okay you got to realize like i've said on the show and nobody can argue against me on this this opens up every ufo conspiracy possible from mk ultra and my labs right through to roswell whether or not eisenhower traded humans for technology it opens up all of the as it even opens up bob lazar again it opens up everything. And see, Dave, that, you, that worries you, me because for, for all that stuff to really get exposed, the U.S. has a long track record of this. We wait until every principal involved has died. Exactly. Before we release that information. So, exactly. I and mean, the majority of them, the majority of them will be dead within 30 years, within 25 years. True. True. Okay. The majority True. of them yep. who are covering up this secret yep. and have, have, you know, that's the way it is. But, you know, that's why the DNI report is garbage. It's absolute garbage. Okay. And it isn't because of anything else. Wait, so wait, 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 the report you're talking, you mean the, 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 uh, the, 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 the big report that just came out? Yeah. Oh, that, that was just that was just that was just that was like that 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 report was basically introducing people to 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 put their feet in the shallow end of the pool when there's a bunch of other uh, the rest of us floating in the deep end. But that was like a the, here, come in, dip your toes in. The water's okay. That's well, I, I I understand that. Okay, but there's a strong reason why they didn't go previous to two thousand four. Oh yeah! Okay. Oh, absolutely. The, and don't the think liability for, guys, is huge. Don't don't think for a second here. Okay, if we want to talk stupidity, and I've said this to my good friend Tom Whitmore from Mufon, Love where that. the hell has Mufon been through all of this? Where has the SCU been through all of this? When all these press conferences are happening about UFOs, where the hell have these groups been? They've been nowhere. They've been silent. And you know what I don't understand is is so MUFON MUFON I understand a little bit better only because they were very recently hobbled. I mean let's be honest, right? The whole J- J- Jan Harzan thing, I mean that's that's a freaking disaster. Yeah, but you, you don't even And have, so that that you don't but even what I was saying the was, thing. No, but all I'm saying is is that they're, they 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 were wounded, okay? Mm-hmm. And so them not them not responding as we would hope they would for at least for a period of time. That makes sense. The SCU and, and Rich Hoffman seems like a really nice guy. Like he really does. I mean, I've, I've been very impressed with what I've seen out of him, but what on earth is going on with the SCU? Like, I mean, for a while they were trying, they, they were coming out with these reports and some of them were really good, but I, I just don't get it. I don't understand what the SCUs, what they're waiting for. Are they waiting for an invitation? I, I, don't, I don't know. But I'm here's baffled. the thing. If if they had a proper PR person who understood the media, they would have been putting out press con- or press releases stating that our scientists are willing to talk about this publicly and instead of, you know, hearing uh and this is no I don't mean this as a slight to Nick Pope, but I'm going to give him a, a shot here, okay? 
why do we keep seeing Nick Pope on television? Yep. He brings nothing yep. to the table. Dead on, man. Do, the, okay. the SCU should be a a a a a a source for for credible interviews, incredible commentators. But that's and, where like, it, they should be rotating. That's where Dave there. McDonald also dropped the ball, and Mufon has dropped the ball. You guys are supposed to be the number one. You claim you're the number one UFO group in the world. Well, why aren't you on the news? Why? Where? Where is your statement regarding what Elizondo says or Melon says or the U? Where's Mufon's statement? Give me a second here. Where's Mufon's statement publicly in the media on this goddamn thing? Yep. Okay. And you know, the thing is that there have to be normal people in the ranks of both of those organizations that are just busting at the seams. They're just like, you know, we've been doing this for years. This is what we've been waiting for. This is the opportunity we've been waiting for. We really get to step yeah. up and 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 throw ourselves Here, in the game. Here's and how do it works. Big. And they're just sitting there. It must be driving them nuts. I'm I'm going to I'm going to give you an example here, okay? That's like saying, okay, when I covered sports sports journalism, that's like saying the the I'll use a baseball term because the majority of our audience is American. A baseball, uh, I get, yeah. Okay, so let's say the um, let's say the Seattle Mariners make a major trade for Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees or Mike Trout. All right. They make a major trade. They have a quick press conference introducing Trout or, or, or Judge. All right. And because there's a major shift in power, in, in baseball now that you got these power hitters going to Seattle into an unfriendly home run stadium, which, which, <laughs> which it is. That's why Ken Griffey Jr. Left first time. Okay. That's like all of a sudden saying, but we're, we, all of our baseball analysts now are going to keep absolutely silent on this trade. Yes. yes. So ESPN, or Fox Sports or MLB's baseball analysts are not going to say a thing. Or to make it even more picturesque, just a couple of days yesterday, we had the Field of Dreams game in Iowa between the Yankees and Chicago White Sox. Oh, Beautiful. Right, they, right. Came, they came out of the corn fields. It was like... Dude, oh man, me, I, I didn't see that. It, I gotta check that out. No, that's cool. it, it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Okay, so that's like having that major league game at that cornfield in Iowa. All right, where they trot out Kevin Costner right at the beginning, and guess what? There's no cameras there. Okay, you okay. take away all the television cameras. There's no cameras there. How can you report on the game? So here you have these brilliant scientists from the SCU and a and a press guy who claims he knows all about the press but knows nothing about how the press works as their PR guy. And then you have MUFON sitting there with their thumb up their ass, okay, not making any comments, yet they're supposed to be by the people, for the people in the world of UFOs, but they're not saying anything. Dave McDonald from MUFON, the president, should be all over. If Nick Pope is on the air, where's the counter? These guys have the opportunity through press releases and through gaining media attention to get in front of the cameras and say, this is what's going on. And they could, they could really be a voice for the experiencers. I mean, they, they could really, I mean, they, they have the case files. They have the, they have Absolutely. the knowledge to but really people stand up for those. A, but then people wonder why there's a, there's a bloody narrative. Okay. Then people wonder why there's a narrative that, that the TTSA, when they came in, could, could do anything that they wanted. So do you think it's possible that, that MUFON and SCU and, 
I mean, I doubt they'd have to say this to SETI because they seem to just want to do it anyway. But the, the, they were they were told to stand down. No, I think they're too stupid to stand up. <laughs> and I mean, I mean that was. I mean, do you realize how crazy this is? I mean, to, if if someone had told me that if someone had told me five years ago that that we would get to this point in disclosure and MUFON and SETI and the SCU would be zip lips i i wouldn't have believed you like I, no. to me like this that is was the whole point MUFON had, was, as i said to tom whitmore okay and and whitmore agrees with me on this as i said to tom whitmore i said bud you guys have waited 50 years for this subject to hit the mainstream and now you choose to be silent so weird. I said, so I said, what weird. kind of I said, what kind of mishmash are you running there? I used a little bit more colorful. Uh, and <laughs> and I actually said to Whitmore, I actually said to Whitmore the last time I talked to him, I said, you know what, Tom? I said, there's one job I want in this world. One job. I said, I want to be the president of MUFON because I'm gonna clean your shit up. I said there would be a lot of people on that board, Tom, uh, that, that would hate me. That org, that org could do, and and I'm not saying that they haven't done good. I, I think I think that the that I think that the independent investigators, the the local the local groups in MUFON, Amazing. there's a lot of really good people that do there a lot are of some really good work. Fantastic, and I agree with you. There but, are but some as a fantastic whole, people. But there is no there's thinking. So much they could be doing. God, there's so th there much is, good. They there's could no be doing. thinking on that board. There's no thinking. How do you drop the ball? You've been waiting half a century for this bloody story. How do you drop the ball at the biggest time when the UFO world needs you? It doesn't matter about Harzan. It doesn't matter about about. Uh, the sex flights that McDonald's McDonald's company had. Right. I saw Twitter go all, oh, I'm offended. How do you right, put right. Dave McDonald in there when he had people pay to have sex in, in the Mile High uh, uh, company? Who cares? Right. It means right. nothing. Stop being offended and look at the big topic. MUFON has members all around the globe. They've been waiting 50 years for this subject to go, public and what do they do they drop the ball and they say well now we're gonna we're just gonna sit silently and watch over here you're the leader you're the leader so maybe maybe with move on what we see is we see independent researchers pop out of nowhere like katie right right and and maybe they maybe they come up with something big. Maybe they come up with something significant, but it's not going to come from the organization. No, they still want <laughs> MUFON still wants to play small time. Guess what? The days of videos with little with little dots in the sky, those are over. Those mean nothing. Look, I would love to go outside right now if I didn't have forest fire smoke uh, up there. You and I wouldn't be talking right now because what I would be doing is sitting on my on my uh, uh, my end my my gravity chair, leaning back, staring up at the Milky Way and the stars, waiting for some aliens to fly over. Quite jealous over what you get to see. Right? Uh, international Playboy. I'm. I don't really see where I'm sucking up. Please uh, define that, if you don't mind, because I would I would love to uh, to understand that comment. All right. But you know, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I've I've seen this in other in other environments where essentially none of the major players that were involved during the early years end up having any significant any significant positions in the future. That's that, because that the, later on, professionals come in and take it over. Think about this, though. Think about this when you have. Okay, and this gets to my original point going back three years ago when I started taking crap from, from uh, UFO Twitter about the whole fake journalist thing. We accept information from any, everybody. Okay, every, and, and we do not, 
when you let me phrase this correctly because my mind's starting to go it's two o'clock in the morning here uh, okay <laughs> and we've been on air for this gets, five this hours gets this is where things get dangerous <laughs> oh oh hold on Okay, I forgot that thought. Let me get, because I just saw internet. He says, International Playboy said, you just said some chapters have good people after torching them. No, uh, let, uh, let me explain that a little bit more. And there is a big, big difference. And John, I think you'll agree with me on this. There is a big, big difference between MUFON's board of directors who run the business side of MUFON and then all of the the investigators and the yes. state investigators who are down below they, it's like two separate entities the people who are doing the grounds work the boots on the ground taking the investigations building up the files there's a lot of good people in there yep. it's yep. the confusion and the old attitude the stale attitude that this board of directors has OK, and they ha do have some people on there who are ha who have some forward thinking. The problem is they don't have a leader who is going to take that board by the balls and say, this is the direction we are going. No, they're All paralyzed. Right? They have they, they were paralyzed by the Jan Harzan situation, which still is not over. OK, yeah. and then they bring in a leader who in, in Dave McDonald, and I've never talked to Dave, so I'm not going to throw him under the bus from everything I've heard. He's a pretty good guy, pretty smart guy, okay? But when the biggest story in the world is coming out that you've been waiting for for 50 years, that is completely on the board of directors for dropping the ball. It has nothing to do with the investigators down below, the boots on the ground people. So I hope that international playboy i hope yeah. that uh, that kind of uh brings a little bit more clarity if it doesn't and let's be honest right that, that that's very normal human behavior right we see that all over the world there are tons of organizations where the bureaucracy on top is 16 ways you know messed up but you have all these small chapters in 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 areas and neighborhoods that you know uh, are doing good work and they're good people and they're working hard and and you know you can't always you can't always you know put the 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 bureaucracy's mistakes on 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 the, the local folk and and I'm not exactly. even saying all the local folk are good but but I've been really impressed with the ones I've I've, I've had a chance yeah. to to interact with yeah and I got a lot of friends in MUFON a lot of friends and a lot yeah. of people have worked at MUFON at some point in their life. Yeah. There's a lot of a yeah. lot of people have, have done a stint as an investigator. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's incredibly common. Um, you can you can learn some good things uh, um, for sure. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's a really it's a really interesting question is to, you know, what how is it that you have, you know, I mean, I don't even know if there's any other ones you could point out. But you look at you look at SETI, you look at MUFON and you look at the the East, uh, the um, uh, SCU. And you have three organizations that were were it's it, it's like it's like training all season to go to, to you know go to spring training and try out and then you just don't show up. Yeah, you know, Dude, you just that's don't even great, go. That's a great example. You, you don't know, even you, go. Yeah, you, you just bust decide your ass all summer and then you like it's like eh, you know what? I'm just gonna go get a beer. <laughs> Forget it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that and it's, that's and a it's great weird. example. It's yeah. weird. No, it, it's it, it's 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 baffling, it's baffling, you know. But it also doesn't help, and I've said this. Nicole Sakic and I have talked about this quite a bit too. It also doesn't help when you have researchers who are promoting. Uh, uh, there's a lot of yeah buts in this field. Yeah, but this person's a good person. Yeah, but. This person uh, has pull on UFO Twitter or something like that. We have to stop with the yeah buts, and if you have to clean up the field too. Uh, Raven is Ryan. Dave, do you th do you think that, or do you think anything new and important will be shared at the making contact get together, or is it now going to be like the Abrams and Netflix show of rehashing and book pitches? Um, 
with with um with that, I think Mark Sims is trying to set up a, an area where people kind of like an online university, a virtual university for contactees, where everybody can go in, share information, and he and Mark has the money to back that. All right. Mark has the money to to go with that. And I don't know what Mark Sims is worth, but I have heard that he is worth millions. And, and, millions. and let me let me let me say this. Someday, someday what night, Mark Fabster. is doing is going to work. Okay, good night, man. Uh someday what Mark is doing is going to work. My personal opinion is that it's not going to happen until VR becomes a dominant interface. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be when VR is a dominant interface that you're going to see this really take off. But you know, that whole, um, that whole uh, movie that came out, uh, Spielberg, um, uh, uh, Oh, what was that name? Name it game. I mean, basically those virtual worlds, they're there, they're working. I've, I've worked at companies where we've built them. Uh, it, it, you can do it, but I don't know if what Mark's putting together now with with the with the technology he's now using, well, if it's well, really going to turn into something. A lot but, of people are, but I I applaud his effort. But a lot of people are balking at the two hundred fifty dollars course. Look, you don't go to college for free. I have no problem. Look, universities and colleges across the United States get donations and backings from alumni all over the place. Mm -hmm. All right. Every a lot of companies, including Spaced Out Radio, my company, has what we call angel investors to help set things up. Then it's mm -hmm. our job to make the money back. Mm -hmm. So Mark may be funding the money for this, but eventually he wants to get his investment back because everything is business. And I don't no, have a problem. And the thing is, is it is it is it it's in my opinion, it, the the people that use the system should if not cover the cost of the system, they should they should cover a portion of the cost of the system. What what I well, have a it, challenge it, with is it is that we have a significant like there are more people out of work in United States right now than has 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 been for for almost a hundred years, right? It is crazy the number of people who are unemployed. And so the yeah. only thing that I would ask is like, so I, I work in an organization called the IETF. Okay. And we're the organization that, that does all the standards for the internet. So how a protocol is made HTTP colon slash slash. That was one of the guys in this yeah. organization, right? We, we create the standards. We write the protocols yeah. that the internet runs on. We have meetings, you know, every, you know, multiple times a year. Okay. And, you know, a, a in-person meeting used to be $750. Now the virtual meetings are $250. Yeah. But for every conference, we have a an email address you can send to where you can apply for a waiver. And you explain, look, I'm at work. I don't have a job right now. I've been, you know, I've, I'm, I'm active in the community. I really want to go. And they waive the fee. And yeah. that, to me, if if they offered that, that would solve the problem. Well, I mean, you know what? I have no problem with the two hundred fifty dollars. Look, I've I've spent money on things. I'm sure it's worth it. You know, I'm not on, saying it's not worth it, and they offer stuff. a money back guarantee. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with Mark ch charging two hundred fifty dollars. What they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to they're trying to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. The unfortunate part about it is. There's a lot of people who have some amazing experiences who would rather use that $250 for groceries mm -hmm. than they would the conference. And that is a choice that everybody is going to have to make over time because this isn't just about a conference. This is about something bigger that Mark is trying to do. Okay. Correct. With he, Danny. He's just using this, this event as a, as a kickoff absolutely. for the platform. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But I, to answer I, I wanted, the question, oh, please go ahead. I, I just want to make one quick comment here. Dark Winter Wolf on on Twitch, I'll be honest with you. I I have tried to learn how Twitch works. And it's funny, John and I had this conversation before. We're gonna the figure show. this out. We're gonna figure uh, this out. I have no idea. I know we broadcast on Twitch. I have no idea how to make Twitch bigger. I really don't. I am so dumb when it comes to Twitch. Uh, so if you know how Twitch works and how we can take advantage of that a little bit better, um, 
let me know. I'd love to have you have a meeting with with my team on how we can improve that. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm all ears. I'm all and, yeah. and I agree with you. I like Twitch as a platform. And I'll be honest with you. A lot of times before the show, I log into Twitch because they have some great, great live music on there. <laughs> they really do. It, you know, from people who, you know, they don't have a lot of fa- a lot of famous bands or anything on there. Uh, I can't get the Twitter stream going, uh, uh, GFG, 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 because uh, when Twitter decided to put Take Periscope down as a platform, that here sucked. on uh, on StreamYard, we could broadcast into Periscope. But when Twitter removed Periscope, that uh, there is no link for Twitter on to broadcast live on Twitter via StreamYard. They'll, they'll so fix that. that. Eventually they'll eventually they'll fix, fix it. So there's yeah. nothing I can do. There's absolutely nothing I can do about... Um, Man, I was listening about, to some cool Twitter. bands. I was listening to some really cool bands through Periscope, like really, really cool home bands that were just putting out some great music. It, it sounded good. I was really enjoying Periscope. I'm really bummed to see that go. But yeah, you know, I, but I, I, I'm I'm gonna do one out. of those. Yeah, I'm gonna do one of those. Um, I'm gonna do one of those spaces uh, events pretty soon here. I, I gotta I gotta figure out a better way to do it. But uh, I'm gonna try. But yeah, but as far as like streaming from here, you're just gonna have to wait for them to to get an API. They basically, they have to expose an API from Twitter Spaces yeah. to well, StreamYard, but so StreamYard the, can link to it. But here's the thing. Twitter canceled Periscope at the end of March. They just hit me a, f- a few days ago where they pulled me off. So I think they're doing it individually. Mm. Okay. on you know, And pulling them off. Because I went and checked on my... like on my uh broadcast area here if i if i go to add new destination and there is nothing on you know like if i go to add periscope it wants me to create a new account that's so maybe weird that's... though because if you're going to migrate people slowly like that the reason why you do it is because you're migrating them onto a new system but they haven't offered any new system yet so that's odd. Well, maybe this will work. Maybe I just got logged out. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I mean, my, my see, is, but my, see, right but now my, I'm trying. Right now I'm trying to log in. Okay, so if I go like this, but they've they've publicly said Periscope is going away. They set a date. I don't remember what the date was. It was but March thirty first. Yeah. So if, if 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 yeah, if it was March thirty first, then there's no point. They're 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 shutting all that down. I don't know why yeah. they're doing that. It kind of irritates me, but you know. That's what happens yeah. when companies get bought. Yeah, so like when I when I just tried to log back in via Twitter, it didn't allow me to. It just kept on going circles and circles and circles and circles because there is no more Periscope. So can you can you reach out to StreamYard and ask them about it? Do you have a contact with StreamYard? Um, something to try. The thing is, is it StreamYard? StreamYard will have. Streamyard will have a, a a technical person that is a liaison to Twitter, and Twitter should have a technical liaison that is a liaison to Streamyard. They're both mm-hmm. big enough that they they should have that relationship. And sometimes all they need is to hear from enough enough customers, get your butt on this. We want this working, and and they get the budget to do it. So sometimes it's worth complaining. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm only going to spend about another 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I'll go to the bottom of the hour. It's 2.13 right now. I'll go to the bottom of the hour, and then I'm, I I still got to work in the morning, So, but I'm having a lot of fun here right now. So, so, um, so here's, here's, here's a question I have for you, Dave. So one of the things we're starting to see, which I knew would happen, is you know, for forever, the big joke has been, you know, that no one can make money in this field, right? With the exception of people that write books, you know, like, you know, may, maybe Dolan, uh, maybe Grant, right? You know, people that get into publishing, right? Um, you know, but for the most part, 
you know, no one makes any money. You know, they might make a little bit, but like nothing that's going to change the fact that they have a day job. And yeah. we all knew that it would it would someday get big enough that it would be possible to to make some money at it. And we're starting to see an attempt to do that. And so but there is this kind of uh, culture in in the field of, of, you know, people that charge for knowledge um, perhaps aren't, you know, giving up, you know, the best knowledge because you somehow paid for knowledge isn't as valuable as free knowledge. And and I get that. I mean, same thing probably used to have with the Internet. People used to think everything on the Internet was, should be free and shouldn't charge mm -hmm. for it. That there was a there was a culture thing we had to overcome yeah. for that. But my question to you is: Good night, Apollo what, Eleven, and there is no hard issues, to, uh, no issues whatsoever. And I'm not upset. You're allowed. You're allowed a great opinion and to bring that opinion into the conversation, which totally. you did. So we totally. appreciate that. Totally, 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 totally. We don't know. We don't. We, look, we're all figuring this out. So my question to you is: Do, do you see a a a, a, a path? Or do you see a vehicle or do you see a time where some equilibrium will be hit and you will see people doing this and 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 doing it for a living in a way that, that the community is cool with? And like, do you see that? Do you see that happening at any point in the future? No, the community is too divided. So they're going to keep trying. I mean, that's the whole point you know, of this. You know what, though? You're going to start seeing, I, I think you're going to see the growth of the clicks a little bit more. And this is something that Nicole Sakic and I have slowly been working on over the last couple of months privately about these clicks in the UFO world. All right. Who belongs to what click? What click is which? All right. Um, you know, we're, we're still in that I'm offended. So because you questioned me, I'm going to block you bullshit. Yeah. You know, we're still involved in that. We're still involved with, with but other a lot stuff. of that's because of, because of the vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. It's because there's, there's not enough to do. And so, so people, you know, they, they busy themselves with, absolutely with, with, with politics, but you, but you have to build a, here's the thing though, is you have to build, whether you call it a team, a click or whatever, like, if you look at the job the debrief has done, whether you love him or hate him, Tim McMillan and uh, and Micah Hanks, I think, have done a great job on bringing, you know, yeah, new yeah, faces, yeah. I agree. new people still in. Hey, bombshell bomber. Yes, we're still live. We're going to be live at <laughs> the bottom of the hour. Um, they, they brought in some good people, okay? Um, and, and, and I like that they're I like that they're trying to mentor people and I, I like that they're trying to cover lots of different content, not just, you know, paranormal yeah. stuff. They're, you know, they're doing defense stuff as, as well. I, I, I like Tim's writing. I like Tim's work. Yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's a it's a you know, I, I think I think as long as they continue to be successful, you're going to start seeing that you're going to start seeing that model get copied. Yeah. But you're going to see that model get replicated. If you, if you look though, everybody's trying to clamor together. Okay. We saw a real, after the TTSA collapse, uh, we saw a, a real shift in, in UFO Twitter, you know, because you had the, the so-called young guns. All right. And, and they were, you know, you know, like Danny Silva kind of worked, worked in, into his own, uh, area Joe Joe Mergia worked into his own area. Uh, definitely not at a hair salon for him. Um, you know, you Don't saw. We, I think we get to blame. I think we get to blame Grant for that whole young guns thing. I think that was his. I think that's his terminology. Yeah. You know, but you see the old guard starting to come together too. That's kind of led by Daniel Sheehan again. Where Daniel, at, at, at however old he is, I think he's around 76, 77 years old, has decided to kind of uh, have one last hurrah and gather all the old timers together to make a push. Yep. All right. And, yep. you know, you have you have your your Elizondo clan. You have George Knapp building a clique with uh, Jeremy Corbell, which includes, you know, a few other pe of the young guns. Yep, yeah, he started. He he started. He started including um, Silva and um, Mergia and, and Ian Mergia. Dole. Yep, yep, yep. And yep. Ian Dole. 
Uh, you have the debrief, which is about and, 12 people deep. And let me be clear. Like if, if, if NAP really mentors them, if NAP really helps them become better at what they do, that that's good for all of us. Right. It is. I mean, that, that, that's, it that's is. at some, it, it, the, the, the clicky infighting is not, but, but the mentorship is. Yeah. The mentorship I improves mean, everybody. But the, but the thing is, I mean, you look at third phase of moon, they have their own click. Dr. Stephen Greer has their own click or his own click. In third phase of the moon. They have a, they have a lot of viewers, don't they? They have a, they have about uh, 800,000 subscribers. I talked to them yesterday. They're good people. I, I have no issue with them. They seem like nice guys. I mean, I, yeah. I can't speak to their content, but they seem like nice guys. Very nice guys. And, and you know, they're a big reason, a uh, big reason why our numbers have jumped up. They gave me so we, you know, they gave me some hints. I mean, Jimmy, I mean, Jimmy Church has his own click of people yep. and his own stable, much like we have our own stable. All right. There's all of these stables that are that are clamoring, right? And we just don't have direction. So, you know, but I'll tell you, you know, in that in that situation, one of the most important things to happen is, you know, if if the if the primaries and those clicks want to you know, um, get puffed up sometimes and, and whatever, that's fine. But the, 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 the younger ones, the, the newer ones to those group, those are the ones that have to build those bridges. Those yeah. are the ones that have to have to reach out and make sure that they keep a good relationship with, with the, with the other groups and keep those communication channels open. Because the thing is, is it, what th this is not, it, this is not a competitive sport. I mean, I know people want to think about it this way, but this is not a competitive sport. This is a research movement, and we can all yeah. help each other out. And we, we don't, where, we don't have to, we don't have to fight. But the, but the infighting happens when the clicks collide, and everybody, and like I said, everybody, like you said earlier, it does not help the field when you got somebody as big as Elizondo going on a podcast that has 30 people and dropping bombs on those podcasts oh. instead of bombs on, on a show that, that like coast to coast or Jimmy or, or, or us or whomever, or even third phase of moon or whomever, where it, that same message is going to explode if it hits a bigger crowd. I and mean, do you think it's possible that's on purpose? Yes. It is on purpose, to, to, and the to reason cause for why, a slower, no, a slower here's the reason why. Lou, because of what happened at TTSA, Lou doesn't care if he's talking to 30 people or 3 million people, all right? He, he just he, wants to be... Lou, yeah. Lou has the dignity and the consciousness to, to understand that if somebody is giving him time to speak, he wants to bring a nugget for them. Yep. Yeah, it, you know, it's true. He he actually he he said it point blank. He said said I I always make sure I come I come with some kind of an offering. And God, man, Dave, I've seen him on I've cuz I tried really hard to keep up with all of his podcasts for a little while. And uh cuz you know, every time you'd get a new little nugget, you know. And yeah. uh, and and God, Dave, there was times, man, he looked so tired. He I is. felt so sorry for him. Like he he was barely holding himself together. You know, like he, he I was a trooper, told... man. I was told the best thing that happened to Lou, the best thing that happened to Lou, and this is from insiders who were very close to him, was that night that he, the last time he came on the air with us, where he absolutely exploded. He, he vented. That was and cool. Then, and and then the next day, uh, the next day he went on with the boys from UFO Garage. Uh, ben and Joe. Yeah, you know, I were... still haven't watched that yet. I need oh, to watch that. They did so well. I Lou was only that. scheduled for like 30 minutes or an hour or 45 minutes. And he ended up staying two and a half hours because they were just having fun. Nice. They were talking cars and they were talking oh, music. Good, good and, for them, dude. And good everything, for them. That's everything awesome. that Lou needed to chill. So Lou was able to get his frustration That's out cool. with me, you know, and and able to explode and vent the, and then nice, the next day he gets the band-aid from 
UFO garage because Ben and Joe, uh, and this is why I promote Ben and Joe so much from UFO garage because they just, they just get it. They just, they're humans. There, there's no it's, agenda it's, there. It's, yeah, it's a, it's such a natural, like it's a safe yeah. environment. Let's have a, you know, it's a nice they are safe the environment. Virtual, they are the virtual. Let's have a beer and let's talk some UFOs yeah. and aliens. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, no, it's so true. You know, and that's cool because you know what that means? That means that after Lou gave and gave and gave for a couple months, that means that you know the community was able to give them back, you know, give back a little bit, you know, give give them yeah. give them a chance to vent and give them a chance to absolutely to relax and and that's cool. That's nice to hear. I'm glad that yeah. played out that way. So that's I nice. mean, uh, GFG, FG, 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 Dave. There's too many shit UFO podcasters, and that could be, but the number is only going to go up. It's not going it, down to a point. To a point. It will go up to a point, but there will be a point where it will start to collapse because the thing is, is it is that right now you have this you have this interesting problem where you know like Lou will go on like someone will go on tour, right? And so you like Ross is a good example, right? Ross is on tour right now, right? Mm -hmm. Ross did your show, he did that show, he did this show, he does that, he does a bunch of shows, right? And if you're clever. And you you seek him out on certain shows where the where the interviewers have a certain style of interviewing, right? Mm -hmm. It's cool because you will get different perspectives. Like there was two people that interviewed Ross like like nearly back to back, and I listened to both, and it was amazing because they talked about completely different things. Mm -hmm. There was almost no overlap Absolutely. between the two, and that Absolutely. was cool, right? But you get to a saturation point where it's impossible for those guests to be on that many shows and, and provide any sort of original presence. And you end up with just horrible replication and then it'll start to collapse back down. And then the danger is, is you don't want it to collapse back down too small. You don't no, want to end up with too few. But I mean, there, but there's some time. good hidden, there's some good hidden talent out there. You look there is. at Jason Gilman. A Canadian podcaster, the UAP Studies podcast. I mean, oh, that yeah, guy yeah, is yeah. rocking the yeah. big names. Rocking yeah, yeah, the big yeah. names. I, I like him. And, I like him. And, you know, he's still growing. Okay. Yep. He's doing a great job and he's still growing. Right. So, I mean, the talent is out there. Are there too many podcasts out there? Yes. Yes, there are. And it's diluting the subject poorly because what happens is uh, it takes away from like competition is great and everybody should be allowed to have their say. If they want to hop on a, a microphone and go on a SoundCloud or YouTube or whatever, why not? The more the merrier. If we're talking about the subject, that's always a good thing. And if Whether people want to listen, People you know, want to you're listen. Providing value, right? So, but the problem, the here's the problem with it. Okay, the problem is we have taken this subject, and if, if you take a thick subject, like say you take a, a a piece of gold, and you stretch that piece of gold out, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. So oh, what's totally. happening? is with these top we we have diluted these topics and, and broken them down so much that instead of getting chunks where the like we had back in the day when it was just coast to coast with art bell yep yep we have yep, we yep. have tens of about i think there's something like ten thousand podcasts in the paranormal yep. field alone alone yep. in north america yep. Yep, and I, and I love his comment. Like now we have podcasters interviewing podcasters. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's well, so true. To, see, and that's something that I try not to do, but it's getting more and more difficult because look, mm -hmm. I'm not here to pro to uh, promote anybody else's show. Okay, but if the person is interesting, you take you take somebody like Swamp Dweller earlier tonight. Yeah, no, totally. Okay. Especially because a lot of them that's have had their own experiences too. That's a different. Uh, that's a different. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, no, it's, a, it's a different. That's a different color horse, you know. That's a different yeah. color horse, but I mean, 
you're just trying for that different perspective. Yep. What are they yep. seeing? So when I see somebody like Jason Gilmet and I see that uh, Ralph Blumenthal has been on his show, I want to talk to the guy because I want to know why Ralph Blumenthal hasn't been on Spaced Out Radio. Right, right. All right. But he'll go on that show. Yeah. It's not an insult to Jason Gilmet or or the great oh, no. job that he yeah, does. No, no, no. It, but no, I want to yeah, know. Yeah, totally, totally, right? totally. You know, I want to know why, uh, you know, a female pod uh, podcaster who took over for Art Bell, who hasn't done a show in a year and a half, gets a Discovery Channel uh, uh, expert role as a UFO journalist. I want to know that. Right? I want public I service want... announcement. Don't ever call yourself an expert about anything. If other people want to call you an expert, whatever. But don't ever call yourself an expert of anything, ever. Real experts don't call themselves experts. You know, it's me nuts. But I mean, you know, as far as our growth as Spaced Out Radio, and I know it's 2.30 here now, and I said I was shutting it down then. But as far as our growth with Spaced Out Radio, it's because we've made a, a lot of mistakes along the way. We listened to the wrong people. We took too much time, which is my fault uh, as the leader. We um, we uh, we took too much time to get to YouTube, uh, especially you the on-camera thing. And I fought that. I fought that. That's completely 100% on me. And, um, but you're so pretty. No, oh, I face for radio. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of mistakes that we have made. Okay. But that's how you learn, man. Like, you yeah, know, the whole the whole right and wrong thing. It's 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 BS. You 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 either teach or you learn. That's the yeah. difference. When you're right, you teach. When you're wrong, Absolutely. you learn. There's value you know, to both. I mean, that's you know? why I'm excited to get our new website put together by Ben from UFO Garage. Oh, is he uh, helping you with that? Yeah, because I'm oh, not good. a techie guy whatsoever, good, good, and that's good. what Ben does during his daytime oh. job. Oh, far out, far okay. out. Good job. So he's building oh, us a nice. brand new, sexy-looking website. Oh, far where, out. And he's going to load it with proper SEOs, which should help us take off. I mean, I talked to the guys from Conflict Radio. Uh, you know, they've got like fifty-three thousand subscribers. They've done maybe one tenth of the shows that I have done. And they've got 53,000 subscribers. I asked them point blank. I said, how did you do it? And they said, we did it by, because uh, I guess one of their friends uh, works for, or used to work for Apple or Google or somebody like that and understands how the algorithms and the SEOs work. And when they tied those SEOs, search engine optimization into yep. the website and tied it into the yep. YouTube channel, their subscribers just took off. Yep. They, it just yep, took it off. So that's what we're create, trying to do. Little here. echoes. Yep. Yep. Right. Totally. That's what we need to do here. So right now we may not, you know, we're growing like, Hey, we got another one tonight in black dragon. Never listen to us tonight, but because of swamp dweller, we were able to black dragon was able to learn about us. And now he's right here. But Black right? Dragon, just so you know, like we love that you're here, but just so you know, this is not a normal night. <laughs> no, no. Usually we're signed off uh, an hour and thirty five. No, two hours ago. Yeah, almost two hours ago we're signed off. But yeah. um, no, it's just it's just the way it is. So we have a lot of growth to do, and 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 you know it's funny. This is why I laugh when when these trolls came in and said that I was buying followers. Because I know sweet F.A. about how this works behind the scenes. I'm just lucky that I have people like John who understand. I have people like Gary who runs our YouTube channel who understands. I've had social media people uh, teach me about how to pro uh, somewhat properly use Twitter and, and Instagram. I don't even know. I don't even know. Uh, you know those, those honestly short... i didn't know you could buy followers on on youtube i mean i know you can do it on twitter and i know you can do it on other platforms i honestly didn't think it was that easy to do that on youtube because yeah. you, youtube uses like that for for to decide how to pay you 
So I would think yeah. they would like they would well, have that but locked here, down really well. Here's the stupidity behind that argument that we're buying followers. Okay. Number one, if you knew me personally, you would know how much I hate the number 13. Okay. <laughs> and the fact that we that that it's probably going we're gonna see 13,000 over the next couple of months. Oh god, Dave. I am so it, with you on that. Driving me absolutely crazy. <laughs> crazy okay I'm so with you crazy on that. so the other thing too is if i, I would, you'd buy you'd buy a hundred thousand freaking users like who's gonna buy five thousand users i mean come on exactly I mean, like so no. i mean here's the other thing too that a lot of people don't realize is youtube's algorithms and it's all over google you can check it their algorithms are always searching for fake accounts and if they see a channel that has bought a ton of fake accounts, that channel can either lose its monetization or lose its uh, the channel completely. They'll shut the channel down. So well, and there, there has been a couple of reaping sessions, hasn't there? Yeah, haven't there been a couple so, times where they've gone through and cleaned house and they, they've and yeah. everyone's lost users? Yeah. So if you're me. Who is a who is a legal business here in Canada? Uh, you know, Spaced Out Radio is owned by a company called SOR Media Ventures Limited, which is owned fifty percent by me and fifty percent by my my angel investor in Vancouver. Okay, do you really think that as I am paying back my angel investor with what we earn on YouTube, that I am going to risk anything? to to uh to uh lose my oh, monetization no, no hell no crazy. hell that, no. no we already walk a fine line with the subjects we're talking to with mm -hmm. the i'm offended crowd running in and out uh with their canceling yeah. and and your canadian business you people yeah. in canada you do things much more like like regulated like you give engineers rings and stuff you know like yeah. i mean it's it's hardcore yeah, so I mean, that's uh, the the one who came at me yesterday and the day before. I mean, I shake my head at that because they're not. Well, prove to me that you're not doing well. First off, who the hell are you? How do you prove that? <laughs> you know, who the hell are you for me to prove my numbers to you when I don't even know who you are? Number two, you're you're trolling, which means all you want to do is no matter what the truth is, if I'm lying, which I'm not, or whether I'm telling you the truth, you're not going to believe me because you've already made up your mind in the way your line of questioning is. Well, so it's, it's, it's a compliment with what it really is. It's, it's a compliment because what it means is that you're rubbing them. You're rubbing them the wrong way because mm. you're doing well and, and either they don't want you to do well or, or, or you're doing well and they're not, or it's, 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 it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a passive aggressive attack is what it is. I mean, it's, Absolutely. it's uh, but, but it is a compliment, you know, and, you know, and um, uh, I'm sorry, what was the swamp dweller guy's name again? I apologize. Uh, Rob. Rob. Rob was dead on when he said, you know, the bigger you get, the, the worse it'll get, you know, Absolutely. I mean, it's like, you know, and th that's how, you know, you're doing well, you yeah. know, once you start really getting, once people start really coming after you, it's like, okay, now. You know, now, now things are doing better, right? The, I mean, the funny part about it is the channel that started that all, the channel that started that all with that rumor mm -hmm. is a great show. I'll never oh, talk yeah. to yeah, I'll yeah, never yeah. talk yeah, 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 about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. The host, yeah. Yeah. the host works his ass off. Yep. He does. Yep. People don't like the host because of because of his his attitude. His, 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 his abrasive moods. <laughs> Absolutely. But yep. I, I will tell you this. He does his homework. He works very hard. He's very and he's, passionate. He's passionate. He's very, very passionate. passionate. And you know what? He deserved his break a long time ago, and nobody gave it to him. I, I agree that with you. That pissed him off. He's yep. a guy who would be great at, at conferences because he's not afraid to speak in detail. Yep. But nobody will give him a conference because they watch him on air and see. 
and see oh man doing. that's yeah see that right? would be that would be risky. and that would i was be trying to get him into san francisco not now but i was trying and i almost had it done but yeah. i mean i will never put down that other show even though i don't watch it anymore I, I mean, we have enough mutual listeners where sure. people come yeah, to yeah, yeah. and say, totally. oh, my God, you should hear what they were saying about you. Right. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing but, you know, the I one thing do. the one thing I, I started paying more attention to, too, is, like, you know, you log into, like, um, uh, Fade the Black, right? And, like, for their live show, sometimes I'll see, like, maybe four or five hundred you know, people watching it. Sometimes I see it, you know, 900 and, and I'm sure it gets higher than that. I haven't seen it higher than that yet, but I'm sure it does. But you know, when you get down to it, you know, that their numbers are their live numbers. Yeah. Uh, what, what I want to find out is, is I bet you their live number, their ratio of live number to views is actually very similar to your number of live yeah. users to views. It, they, you know it, what it's, I want? it's a grand multiplier. You know what my goal is? Is to work this channel hard enough properly, okay? I want one of those 100,000 subscriber YouTube plaques. Because YouTube gives out a a, a 100,000 subscriber uh, plaques. I want one of those. That's what I'm aiming for. They also give one out for a million, too. Yeah, they do for a million, and I think they do for 10 million. Ten million. Yeah, I think I think ten million. Well, you've seen that one kid that just plays with toys, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, man, that kid. <laughs> boy, that kid made twenty nine million dollars last year. <laughs> oh, man, it's so. But you know, but once again, that that family, they work hard. They do. They do. They work hard. That that's a, they put on a show. You know. You know. I mean, it's um. Yeah, but it's funny. It's really funny. It's like it's it's what a crazy world, you know. But you know, the one thing I will say too about about how this is all changing. The comments you made earlier about people under a certain age, you know, being in the click to, and so forth. You know, people used to really complain about you know the internet um, replacing you know television and so forth. And you know, one thing that I've I've come to to notice is that now that YouTube has gotten as popular, right, think about how many people now listen to long form interviews. Very few. Well, but it's an it's a it's actually a number. I yeah. mean, there's actually people that actually listen. Well, wh- when did you ever ever see on TV anyone sitting there listening to two or three people talk about intellectual topics for three hours, right? For yeah. two hours, right? Never happened, right? Yeah. And now it's happening on YouTube. That that's a yeah. that's an uplift of of communication. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's only, it's only going to expand, you know, and if we're blessed enough uh, with this show to get to that level, we'll see, we'll see where it goes, you know, and I, and I hope to get there, you know, but I, Hey, I get frustrated. I get mad. I mean, John, you and I had a conversation the yep. other night after the show, I was pissed after the show, you yep. know, I mean, it's, it's hard because it's cutthroat and, and you don't want it to be cutthroat. You want to be able to work with people, but just because you want to work with people doesn't mean people want to work with you, right? Yeah. Well, and, and and it's hard too because when you when you when you have another full time job, yeah. the the energy you get to put into this, it 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 it's got to come from someplace personal. You know, it, 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 it that's the only way you're going to get the energy to do it. And so it's it's hard not to take it, you know, personally. You know, I mean, it's it's um. It's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a really good challenge for for a person to be honest. absolutely like like I'll give you an example like there's a lot of people who listen to this show who can't afford to super chat they would love to donate ninety nine cents or a dollar or twenty dollars oh, totally or, oh or whatever totally. it is but oh, you totally. know what you know what though I look at a twenty dollar super chat or a fifty dollar super chat the same way I look at a ninety nine cent super chat. Or someone who said, and I've had listeners say, private message me and say, look, Dave, I'm in a real tough bind financially. I cannot afford to to give you a super chat. But you know what I can do is I can share your show on my social media. Totally. All means the same to me. I, I, Dave, I'm astounded that anybody 
does that. I mean, when I first heard that this super chat thing was happening, I, I got to be honest, man. I thought it was going to be a flash in the pan. I really didn't think anyone was going to do it. Yeah. And uh, uh, the fact that anyone does it is like, yeah. wow. Like I am, yeah. especially when you get it from other countries. Oh yeah. man. Like, oh, dude. I'm, I'm in awe. I'm in awe. Yeah. It, it, is, I, it is so cool. You, you know, so what, cool. one of my, one of the, my, one of my biggest thrills and I haven't done it yet. And I've got a big open space on my wall right right here. You can't see it. But I want to get a map of the world, right? Because I want to be able to tag on there where our listeners are. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to be able to yeah. tag on there. You know, like when we have uh, Iberata from Singapore. And, and yeah, yeah. a few weeks ago, we had a couple people from India listening in. Yeah. And, and there, was that, there was that one woman from Japan. Yeah, um, Chris Mo yep. from Aus is from Australia. Yep. For a long time, we had a guy in Thailand listening in uh, every day. We had it used to have a couple people from South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and it's weird because they're all named Chad Smith. <laughs> who, right? who, who returns? <laughs> yeah, who returns? Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we have a, we, you know, like watching the chat room fill up and, and there's five, six people from Australia there, you know, or, and New Zealand and, and, yeah, you know, I, I got to admit, Dave, like that's one thing I, I really look forward to because, you know, in, in my, in my last big corporate job, I, I, I traveled a lot and I, I actually, I got to like, I got to see 14 different countries, um, doing public speaking and, uh, and I would often get to hang out you know, with like the local teams afterwards for a while, get to know people and so forth. And uh, man, like, you know, you so quickly see how, you, how, how much we are all just exactly the bloody same. I mean, it is so amazing. And once we get to the point where this field is big enough that we're having conferences, virtual or, or physical, where, where you have a significant number of people there coming from, India coming from, you know, uh, all these different places, or we start having conferences like the IETF thing I'm part of. We have our, we have each conference we have in a different place. So we'll have it in, 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 in Singapore, uh, one quarter and next quarter we'll have it in London. Next quarter we'll have it in, in Tokyo. Next one we'll have it in, uh, we go to Singapore a lot and we go to these different places and you get people coming from all, and it, man, it is amazing to meet some of these people. Cause you know, the, what, what no one likes to admit is that the 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 population distribution of intelligence and amazement is is completely even everywhere. So like you you know these people spring out from these other countries and they're brilliant and they have these gorgeous ideas and there's so much passion and it's just I'm 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 looking so forward to seeing a real international push come out uh, for for. Uh, <laughs> push out from the Bledsoe Discord. Nice. <laughs> are you playing? Are you playing this on the Bledsoe Discord? No, no. But but that but the I, but I'm I'm on that too. And and uh, and and uh, G, uh, GFGF just posted saying shout out from the Bledsoe Discord. You, you know what's funny? I, I can guarantee you. Uh, oh shit! Look at this. Oh damn! Thank you guys. Way too kind. Yeah, dude, that's you guys are awesome. Uh, you you know what you know what's <laughs> funny is uh, yeah. Now I planned on shutting this down. Now I got to keep going. But uh, what, what's really kind of cool about it all is you'll never see spaced out radio on Discord. I hate Discord with a passion, <laughs> man. <laughs> I remember. I'll, I'll tell you why. I remember a couple. I was on. You know, everybody's like, "You got to get on Discord. You got to get." It. Okay, yeah, man. I'm with the times. I'll get on Discord. And I logged into Discord one day, and I could. I, I turned my phone off, but Discord was still playing, and I couldn't log out. Right, and I'm trying to log out, and. I can't, I can't get logged out and people are still hearing me. And I'm like, this sucks. So I, I turned it off and I've never gone back. And then I went back a few months later. Oh, you got to come back to discord. We're all chatting on discord, discord, discord. And I go back there and nothing again. 
I couldn't turn the goddamn thing off. And then I couldn't get my mic working, you know? And it's like, I've had I, I haven't even, I haven't even used, I haven't even used any of the voice stuff on it yet. But you know, the, the thing that's funny is this, this Bledsoe discord group, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great people in there. And you know, my problem is, is that like, I have enough trouble keeping up with Twitter, you know? And then there's some people that only post on Facebook. They don't post on Twitter. So you have to follow that. And then, then, then like, like someone else just started a discord and they like, you know, they're right. People I'm like, I'm sorry. I, you know, I would love to, I, I don't have time for that. I mean, like, yeah. like it's, it's crazy keeping up with this stuff. And you know, what started yeah. happening is, is discord discord keeps going off my, on my watch. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you know what I can do now? I can now measure how active the blood. So discord is on a given day by how much battery I have left at the end of the night. Right. Basically, if, if my watch battery is drained, I know there was a really good conversation going on on Discord. <laughs> right. Okay. I swear to God, this time uh, when we're at five hours, forty nine minutes, and fifty seconds. Uh, at at the top of the hour, I'm no, shutting yeah, down. I, I got to yeah, get to bed. Yeah. No, I got to no, get no, to I, bed because no, I got to be up at I got to be up at seven forty five for work. Me as well. Me as well. Uh, me, but, as well. Uh, me as well. Um, so I so I, I I got another question for you since we got a couple minutes. So yeah, at 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 some level, right? The U.S. government uh, exists actually for for one reason, and that is it to facilitate interstate commerce, right? I mean that that's that's fundamentally okay. one of the main purposes of the U.S. government is to facilitate internet interstate commerce. At some point the 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 reason for contact with another species is for interspecies exchange it's for interspecies okay. commerce at some point we will be trading goods selling our goods and buying goods from them and and there will be a market that will be a, a, that exists between us and whoever it is. How far away do you think we are from that? Decades. 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 I'm I'm hoping not more than thirty years. I'm hoping not more. I'm I'm worried it's going to be more like fifty to seventy, but I'm I'm hoping it'll be thirty years. Like I want to be able to buy art. From another place and put it in my house. That'd be kind of cool. I want to. I want to hear what kind of music <clears throat> that the young people listen to, that the yeah. that the older ones hate. Right. I want to. I want to. I want to. I, I, man, I want to see. And I like food. house music. I like ED. Here's something. Oh strange yeah. About me. I love EDM music. I do. Oh, I, actually, I'm right there with you, man. I I love I I love house music. I'm I, oh, yeah. I'm actually I I have an incredibly eclectic um an incredibly eclectic taste for music. There's actually not a whole lot of music I I don't like. The, the only um, two mu the only two brands of music I cannot listen to, I cannot stand anything country, drives me up a wall, and that real hardcore gangster rap, not a fan of it. Yeah, so so some of the stuff like if if I can if 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 some of the really hardcore gangster rap if I can find if there's a, if there's a good beat, then yeah. then I, I'm cool. But if it's yeah. if it's too much dialogue and like and it's like not Nicki relative Ma to me, like Nicki Minaj I, and uh, and like uh, who's the idiot who is married to the Kardashian, Kanye West. That stuff can't, I can't stand that either. But, that but you know what's funny is it is it, I said I, I said him. the same thing about country, right? And then, and then someone pointed out to me, they're like, yeah, but you, you listen to Leonard Skinner and you listen to, and they started pointing out all these bands that like, you know, Don't care. That, you know, they, they, they got a little bit of a Southern, you know, a little bit of a country feel to it, you know, let's so I got to Mark, admit, you know, let's get to Mark in Australia's comment because we are running out of time. Yeah. yeah what do you uh, say? What, what would Dave, what would make you walk away from this subject? Uh, three things. Absolute exhaustion, because I could tell you working two jobs. I've worked 16 hours a day for the uh, six days a week for the last six oh, years. Ice tea body count, yeah, yeah. All right, that's crazy, man. 
I've worked 16 not, hours you know, a day for six years. You know, just so you and, know, that's not good for I'm your tired. health. What's that? It's not good for your health. Oh, no. No, I, I fully understand that. <laughs> I fully understand that. Uh, but you know what keeps me going is the progression. Um, number two, if the Canadian government ever came up to me and said, shut down your show, here's 100, 200 grand or a million dollars to shut down your show, I'm gone. And I mean that because that pays off my mortgage, that pays for my kids' think- education. Absolutely. I could be bought no, that no, way. no, no, no. I know. I, I know. I, I agree with you. But what but like, does the Canadian government ever do crap like that? No, no, they never. Oh, would. OK, all right. I they never say, would. In the U.S., I think they'll just shut you down and they won't yeah. pay you for no, no, I, 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 I have mentioned many a times and I say it in jest. I can be bought. I can be bought. You know, actually, actually, I'm wrong. There was a gentleman. There was a gentleman in, in Roswell. And who was who suddenly changed his story. And right when he changed the story, he got a brand new truck. Yeah. And no one ever proved anything. But the rumor was that the, the reason why he shut up was because they gave him a bunch of money. He bought a new truck. And so so I take that back. There have been times where people. Oh, have been yeah. I mean, if, if the Canadian government ever said to me, came up to me and said, look, we don't like what you're doing. We can't stop you, but what would it take to stop you from doing spaced out radio? Million dollars. Million dollars. Now, that doesn't yeah. sound a lot in today's money, but you know what? It makes me mortgage-free, debt-free, pays for my kids' colleges, and allows me to buy a motorhome and, uh, and <laughs> to, to go wherever I want. You know, Nobody says you have to leave the subject to stop broadcasting the show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. The other thing that would, uh, the other thing that would make me leave, uh, the other thing that would make me leave would be probably if something happened to my children, one of my kids. Uh, and I don't know how I would, I would react to that. Um, yeah, that would be hard. I, I have yeah. to admit, the other thing that I would struggle with is it, is it if I, if I, if I if I ended up in a in a if I ended up at with a job where 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 this started negatively impacting the job and it was a job that I really loved, you know, if it was a job that I really loved yeah. doing and somehow this 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 hurt that, then that would be a that would be a tough choice. But like you said, just because you stop just because you stop talking yeah. doesn't mean you're gonna stop reading. Doesn't yeah, mean you're I mean, gonna stop listening, you know. I mean, I, mean yeah, I would just change the uh uh, uh, I, I would just change the, the address. I mean, like I, here's, here's my boss during my daytime job, my boss's biggest fear. Like my boss is my be- one of my best friends. His biggest nice. fear is my show gets picked up. <laughs> right. His biggest That's fear awesome. is my show gets picked up because he knows I would quit. Like, like I'll be honest with you. I will be completely honest That's with awesome. you. If okay, like George Norrie's contract comes up in 2022, okay, and th- he'll likely oh. sign another contract after that because he's oh, having a lot of fun please. with what I he's doing. Not. But if Coast to Coast AM ever called me up and said, "Hey, you know, we want to bring you in as a as a uh, uh, a fill-in host potentially for the future to, you know, see where George goes to the future. And let's say they, let's say George retires and I get offered the coast position. Oh God, that would shut spaced out radio down. Can you imagine? That would shut spaced out radio down. Can you? Do I imagine? see that happening? No, because I think George is in the in the hot seat for at least another seven to ten years. I, like what I what I would what I would. Man, you know, because like having 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 my own show, I find I I don't know, man. Like you people work yeah. too hard, but you know, oh, but yeah. like you know, but like like doing like the weekend thing at oh, yeah. coast to coast, like what what George Knapp does. Oh yeah, man. Oh my god, what a dream that would be. That would be so it, awesome. It would, you know, <laughs> that and, would ruin you, Dave. <laughs> and and you know you know the cool part. Is is this that if if I if that ever happened, I'd have a 
I'd put it in a, in a contract. Like if any major network ever picked this up, even Sirius XM or somebody like that, uh, the big thing that I would do is I would, I'd move to Vegas. Ah, uh. I'd move to Vegas in a heartbeat. Part of my con, any, I, that's the one clause I have in my, co- in any contract. So if anybody's listening, that's the one clause that I want that if you're in the States and you pick up spaced out radio to go syndicated, I Dave, really, I tell you, man. really want to move to Vegas. There are much nicer places to live in the United States than Las Vegas. Yeah, but I mean, I'm a dude, I'm a night person. Uh, all right. I mean, I, yeah, uh, okay. I, I got a good buddy who lives there. I used to go there a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's a nice place to live. Oh, it's not so much that coast to coast is specifically like that different. It's that the, the audience that you get to talk to Absolutely. I mean, coast to coast is like, they'll get like 10 million people listening. Like that's, we got, that's we got 20 seconds. Thing. All right. Well, we hey, got Dave, 20 seconds. It John, good night. Fun, Thanks dude. for hanging out late. Thanks to all the audience uh, hanging out hey, late. All Thanks for all the out, super man. chats. Mm-hmm. Much love. Uh, Lynn Wallington, uh, the next two nights, I'll quickly give you Lynn's uh, uh, schedule for tomorrow. Uh, it is uh, tomorrow night is uh, Rebecca, or later tonight, Rebecca Hardcastle, who will be talking uh, UFOs, ETs, and contact. And then on Sunday, it will be Susan Messino, who uh, is a rock and roll paranormal author. You'll love her. Oh, far out. She's got great shows. So on that end, three or six hours of broadcasting, I'm going to bed. I'm done. Later, guys. Good night, Dave. Good night, everybody.